Thank you very much. Welcome to the September 10th, 2012 Select Board meeting. Uh, we'll be starting with public comment. Uh, it, we hardly ever have anybody here for public comment, so if you don't get a chance to speak tonight, then please come back to another meeting because usually we're very lonely during the first 15 minutes of the meeting. Um, could I get a show of hands on how many folks want to speak during public comment? About seven. Okay, so I'm going to start with issues that are not on the agenda. So some folks I think are here for shelter issues. Some folks are here for flag issues. Are there other issues that I didn't just name? Mr. Vickery, what's your, your a different issue that's not on the agenda? Okay, very good. Okay, um, Mr. Blaustein. If everyone could be as brief as possible so we can fit as many comments in as possible before 645. Thank you. Please identify yourself with the mic. Jeff Blaustein from Precinct 6. I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but I've been watching the reaction to the select board's decision about flying the additional flags downtown. I also looked at the clip of the interview of one of the residents on Fox News, and I saw the caption, Massachusetts town won't fly American flag on 9-11. While there may not have been anything intentionally misleading in what was said, the captions were. The town of Amherst, like many of its residents, flies the flag proudly every day of the year in numerous locations. It flies its, it flies its flags at half staff on 9-11, as on other days of mourning. And it has an annual sol solemn ceremony to mark September 11th. I want to state as boldly as I can, this is not a disagreement about respect for the flag or our country. Rather, it's a disagreement about how different people want to mark the tragedy of 9-11. I was disgusted and saddened by the way our town has been, been misrepresented, and I'm saddened that there are people who seem to be okay with this misrepresentation. Ms. O'Keefe has done an excellent job of attempting to set the record straight. I'm here to praise her diplomacy in dealing with this. I'm here to speak for many of the, in the community who are, I believe share my views on flying flags. I saw on Fox News that Mr. Kelly has heard from nobody who disagrees with him. Why don't those people who disagree speak up? I think it's fair to say that people are scared of repercussions. Really unfair, mean-spirited comments have been directed at Ms. O'Keefe, the select board in our town, in large part because of misinformation about the policy of the select board and about what the people of Amherst believe. While there may be a few individuals in Amherst, and I would guess in every town in the Commonwealth, who believe that the flag stands for something different than the rest of us, I'm comfortable stating that most of our, our residents have great respect for the flag. People mourn loss of life in different ways. Some people do it alone, some do it in groups. Others obviously find, com com find comfort in doing it very publicly. In some religions and cultures, it's appropriate to send flowers to mourners, and in others, that's a faux pas. To some, a wake is a time for party, a celebration of a person's life, and for others, wakes are solemn times to mourn the loss. Who has the right to dictate to the rest of the community the appropriate way for us to mourn, the appropriate way for each of us to remember? To me, the display of flags on light poles and flag waving is, not for, is, is, excuse me, is for celebratory occasions, for happy times like the 4th of July and, and Flag Day. In contrast to me, a flag at half staff is a sign of communal mourning. Others have made clear they have a different view. That's fine, but I urge them to respect the opinion of others. I would not decorate light poles on some of the holidays that the town does. A flag at half staff says it all to me. The vocal individuals should not interpret the views of people who disagree with them as meaning they don't care. It simply may mean they choose to mourn in a different way than they do. That should be the end of the story. Sadly, it's not. Isn't it time to just accept that reasonable people can agree to disagree? Isn't it time to remember that the flag symbolizes our freedom, including our freedom to mourn loss of life in the way each of us sees as appropriate? I sincerely hope that nothing I've said will be misrepresented or taken out of context um, to claim that I don't respect the flag or our country, nor mourn the loss of senseless life of 9-11. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other folks who'd like to speak, uh, I'll get Mr. Kelly. Well, Larry Kelly, South Pleasant Street. You've got to be quick here. We're trying to fit in as many Sorry. as possible. That was my moment of silence. Um, so I'd like to, s to ask the select board to allow the flags to fly tomorrow. I, I know we discussed this on August 27th, two weeks ago. Um, but there are two new pieces of information that I think are very vital to this. And if they had come up on August 27th, it may have changed your mind, although you didn't actually take a vote on August 27th, and you never closed the public hearing. So <clears> as far <throat> as I'm concerned, you can act on this tonight and not be in violation of open meeting law. Exhibit A, in probably in response to your lack of vote or lack of taking a vote on two weeks ago, the firefighters union issued a public statement strongly supporting that the flags fly. And no one has more of a right to talk about flags and death and mourning than firefighters who lost 343 
that day and 60 law enforcement personnel and 14 EMTs. Uh, item two I would submit is in response to the Fox News report, and I had nothing to do with the graphics, and I listened to it, didn't watch it, but listened to it about an hour ago, and the word patriotism <clears throat> never escaped my lips. I never questioned John's patriotism. I never questioned Madam Chair's patriotism. I never questioned the town's patriotism whatsoever. But in response to that, you remember the Bulletin and Gazette both did front page stories about Amherst getting the Fox News treatment. And interestingly enough, the Amherst Bulletin <clears throat> put up on their Facebook page, and all around it are the articles that they wrote that are correct. The front page articles in the Gazette get it right, obviously. They have your statements. They have everyone's statements. We know what the facts are. They're there, and they're on their Facebook page, and they took a poll. They're running the poll. It's still open right now. And the interesting thing about the Facebook poll is there's no anonymous posters. When you do a thumbs up on Facebook, it shows who you are. You can't do anything anonymously. When you vote yes or no to something, it shows as Larry Kelly voted yes to this, not some anon who you have no idea who that nitwit is. It's like real people taking a vote. And I just want to read the results. I checked them about a half hour ago. Uh, yes, fly the flags every single year, 165 votes. <laughs> Why the hell is this even a question, 21 votes? Yes, every year, five votes. Yes, they were innocent men and women and children murdered by terrorists, 27 yes votes. We should fly them every day, eight votes. Yes, exclamation point, three votes. Select boards compromise every five years is adequate. Two votes, no, one vote. So if you do the math, it's 229 yes to two the compromise that the select board favors every five years. And as I said, right next to it somewhere on that Facebook page is the front page article laying out all the facts. And I think also the Emmer's Bulletin editorial, which basically calls me an extremist and strongly favors your once every five year stance. So on their very own web page, they're getting beat 115 to one in a poll. Yeah, obviously not scientific. But I looked at some of those names. Some of those people I know, yes. But a lot of them are from Amherst, you know. So you have two people that support you. You have twice, uh, 115 times as many who don't support you. Thank you um, very much. i got to move on. One to last thing. Okay, just very segueing quickly. from there. The other thing I wanted to ask is let's settle this. Let's get this over with. Let's not let this last two weeks of acrimony just be put aside and then pick it up again a year from now. Let's get this thing over with once and for all. You can put on the ballot an advisory question. Simple majority vote. Put it on the ballot this spring. And three years ago, when you made the compromise deal, the first compromise, Jerry Weiss's compromise, the once every three year, which to this day I think is dumb compromise. One of you tried to get me to make a deal to say, okay, if you pass this compromise, Larry, will you go away? Will you stop coming to us every single year? And I told you that night, no, I wouldn't. And I did come back the very next year. But here I am here tonight. And I'm telling you right here and now, I will make that deal with you. If you put it on the ballot for this spring and the people of this town vote that down, if they agree with you that they should fly never or once every five years, I will stop. Okay. I will Thank stop. you very much. Let the people decide. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vickery, and please identify yourself with the mic. Peter Vickery, 71 Cherry Lane, Amherst. Thank you, Select Board, and Mr. Town Manager. As you know, June <coughs> earlier this year, U.S. Geological Survey published a report that suggested that there may be natural gas deposits under western and central Massachusetts. Recovering them at this point is probably economically unfeasible, but at the pace of development of hydraulic fracturing, it may not be the too distant future before it does become economically feasible to attempt to recover natural gas from under western and central Massachusetts. The most likely method of doing that is hydraulic fracturing, which is a devastating process for air and water. Common sense would suggest this is a matter for federal regulation. In fact, there's a loophole in the relevant federal statutes, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and assorted uh, environmental statutes. So it's a matter for the states, and Massachusetts so far has not taken steps to regulate hydraulic fracturing or natural gas extraction at all at the statewide level. So we could do, and I suggest we do do, and uh, what some other communities in different states have been having success doing, 
which is regulating at the local level, at the municipal level. Some communities in New York and Pennsylvania and further afield have taken steps to regulate hydraulic fracturing within the borders of their town, and those have withstood, for the most part, uh, judicial challenge in court. <coughs> so I'm thankful for uh, Chair O'Keefe's suggestion that the first port of call for this would be the Water Supply Protection Committee, that they should take first look at this, and then I hope we can have a, a broader discussion about how the town ordinances can be amended to protect the community and communities surrounding us and society at large from the deleterious effects of hydraulic fracturing. So thank you for taking this step and I look forward to watching it as it progresses. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for coming in. All right, I'm going to try and call on two more people here. Um, let's see, Mr. Bloom. I'm going to start with Mr. Bloom, and if you could possibly make your statement shorter than is written. Uh, I'm Steve Bloom, Precinct 10, uh, 259 Lincoln. Uh, dear Select Board members, I'm here at the bequest of the Planning Board, which has appealed to the public to communicate to the Select Board the extreme urgency of the current housing crisis engulfing Amherst. According to the minutes of the Amherst Planning Board Zoning Subcommittee meeting of July 18, 2012, at a recent UMass Master Plan meeting, the university expressed its satisfaction <coughs> with its current mix of on-campus and off-campus student housing and announced its intention to greatly, quote, end quote, expand its student population. This declaration poses an enormous problem for the town of Amherst, whom the university is now expecting to absorb its overflow with limited capacity to do so. If the select board had allowed Professor Karlstrom to make his presentation tonight, they would have learned the purchases of single-family homes by LLCs is accelerating at a deeply alarming rate. Current economic conditions and a rapidly growing demand for student housing because of the university's lack of it has encouraged absentee landlords and speculators to fill the gap by purchasing distressed and undervalued properties and renting them to unsupervised students, many of them living on their own for the first time. And contrary to prevailing opinion, this is not a localized problem, just afflicting historic RG neighborhoods, although the situation is soon approaching tipping point in the RG neighborhoods, most near the university, but townwide with vulnerable properties being purchased and converted into student rentals everywhere absentee landlords can find a toehold. Public records indicate recent sales to LLCs on Shumway Street and in Echo Hill. Town government's apparent willingness to safeguard the rights of those absentee landlords and speculators, some of them not even residents of our community, to reap exorbitant monetary rewards from their properties to the detriment of the quality of life of those full-time residents who must live in close proximity to them is mystifying. Already great harm has been done. Law-abiding, tax-paying families have been driven from long-cherished homes to the community's great loss. Twenty-some years ago, the town voted a moratorium against subdivisions on public safety grounds. After 45 student arrests in one weekend, just two weekends ago, and the entire fleet of ambulances now being put on standby every weekend to deal with expected incidents of alcohol poisoning, I submit there is an immediate and pressing threat to the town's public safety posed by the rapid spread of unregulated sales of single-family residents to LLCs. I therefore propose another moratorium, this time putting a temporary spot stop to the purchases of single-family homes by LLCs on such grounds be put into effect until the planning department formulates a permitting system for LL rental properties to be presented to town meeting. Among other things, this permitting system should pro include provisions that after a number of clearly defined infractions, which includes no noise as well as nuisance call, not just arrest, a negligent landlord's permit to rent can be revoked for a set amount of time or be refused for renewal. The university should be informed of these infractions as, as well and contact the parents of those cited. Such a system should include parking permits, fines, and fees to finance it. Similar systems already in place in other college towns can be used as templates. Article 1 of the zoning bylaw states that the zoning bylaws are, quote, for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. It doesn't mention any obligation to abet the exploitation of students, welcome as they are passing through, and certainly not to serve as absentee landlords and speculators looking for a quick, easy buck. Town's governance's primary duty is to protect the rights and well-being of all of its full-time citizens, even those in easily sacrificed areas. Please don't let inertia and the powers that be degrade, despoil, and ultimately destroy Amherst's, Amherst's unique birthright. Once it's gone, it's gone for good. And this place, this very special, yet very fragile place, becomes just like any place else. Respectfully, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman in purple. And if you could please identify yourself. Kenny Johnson. Uh, I just read in the papers about the uh, select board concerning the uh, 
the uh, uh, getting getting money for the uh, uh, for the uh, housing <coughs> of, of homeless people. And what I want to say is, um, uh, this has been going on for quite some time, and it seemed like people that's in charge, it seemed like it's the stone age is like I'm saying. Um, I take care of a lot of homeless people for years in my apartment. And, and it seems that people seem to think that homeless people are uh, people of different, uh, are bad, or going to cause trouble. But right now, people that have got uh, professional jobs are like a check away from being homeless. And I can tell you right now, I have someone who is a, a very professional computer uh, person, has a, had a very good job, making 100000 a year. And uh, right now I'm helping him out. And, and, and what I've been saying is, and what I'm trying to tell you guys is, if you look on the street and you see the guys with the signs, it's gonna be multiplying year after year. And after a while, you ain't gonna be safe in your own neighborhood. So I'm, I'm saying to the people that's in power, look, you guys should wake up and see, you know, smell the coffee and do something about this. Plus, if you would just take time to just build uh, four or five uh, low, income, uh, low income housing, it would kind of like solve the problem right away. So uh, I'm not just looking to just get a shelter because I don't like shelters anyway because you take care of people at night and throw them out in the morning. It's like we do cattle, we feed chickens and cows and we eat them because we don't eat people. But <laughs> you take care of people at night and say what a good job you're doing at seven o'clock in the morning, you throw them out and they got nowhere to go. <clears throat> Dunkin' Donuts don't want to keep them. I mean, the Dunkin' Donuts used to keep them, but I, I try to get them to come to my house. I put posters up, and they don't want people to come to my place, so the landlords don't want them to come to my place, but I try to help people out. But what I'm saying is uh, this is gonna multiply and get worse, and I just can't figure out, we could send, uh, you see the spaceship we send to Mars? We could do all that, and we can't, we can't just get it together, how come? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming right. in. Okay, I need to move on from public comment. Um, just to be clear, um, the select board doesn't take action on anything that's discussed in public comment because none of this stuff is on the agenda. Um, to clarify one point from Mr. Kelly earlier, there was no public hearing on the previous discussion, so it's not a question of not being open uh, or closed at this point. Um, there will be public comment on various issues that will happen later in the evening. So if folks are here for those things and, and want to talk and want to speak to those, then then they certainly can. But just so everyone is clear, Ms. Stein, I would like to make one announcement about the flag. I requested from the governor's office that flags of municipalities be lowered to half staff in honor of 9/11, and I received word tonight that they would be. Thank you. Okay, uh, all right, so our first item then is a 945 item, uh, the intention to lay out town ways, Olympia Drive and Authority Way. We have Mr. Zomek here to speak to us about this. For folks who are watching at home, uh, this information about this and all other subjects is available on the website and the select board's web packet. <clears throat> Mr. Zomek, welcome. Thank you very much. I will try to be very brief tonight. I know the board has a very full agenda. Uh, I believe you received the uh, memo from the town manager last week in your packet. I think uh, the information provided for you by Sharin Everett from Copeland and Page was very clear. Uh, tonight's action is really asking the board uh, to state their intention to lay out Olympia Drive and Authority Way as town ways. This is the first step in the process. Um, we'll be working with town staff and town council and HAP, uh, the developers, the selected developers of the 42 units of affordable housing there over the weeks uh, between now and town meeting uh, to get all of those steps in place. Um, so I think Shereen uh, Everett's uh, memo laid it out quite nicely for you. Thank you. It was a very detailed memo uh, and much appreciated. Um, if we could just step back a second and, and speak a little bit to why. So this is, sure. we're doing the, the Olympia Oaks housing project there. Currently the university owns this, this land and those public ways. If you could just talk about why this transfer needs to happen, what difference it makes. Sure. Uh, those roadways for uh, 
a long, long time have been owned by the Commonwealth uh, through the university. Uh, you know that since the late 80s, the town has been attempting to um, develop affordable housing at the far end of Olympia uh, Drive. Uh, that project is happening. We have a uh, development partner, HAP, who has secured uh, significant financing for both the housing development for 42 units, uh, as well as funds to upgrade the roadway. Uh, the road uh, is in relatively poor condition, does not meet current, uh, even though it's not a town road presently, it doesn't meet town standards. Uh, so we're in a good position where the grant funding that has been obtained by HAP for the affordable housing uh, development includes monies to bring the road up to town standards. So there's a, really a uh, dual process underway. We have through state law a local process to accept a town way, and this is step one of that process. The select board voting a notice of intent uh, will then go to the planning board and then hopefully to town meeting uh, in November. Uh, meanwhile, because it's state owned land, there's a process through the UMass trustees and ultimately the state legislature to uh, uh, turn that land over to the town. And so our town meeting vote to accept the streets would be contingent upon having those actions uh, come to fruition at the state level. So ultimately we end up with a, a uh, sorely needed uh, 42 unit affordable housing project and improved uh, public roads up to the town standards. Thank you. Um, typically when we accept public ways at town meeting, it's because the road has come up to the town's standards. How does this work in relation to that? Uh, we're still working on the actual wording and, and in terms of the timeline uh, for the road construction, but Dave might have more. Uh, yeah, as the memo lays out, there's the process with the planning board and then the 45 day period. Um, and of course the warrant will be generated in that time, time frame as well. So we're currently working with HAP uh, and, their, uh, and their funding sources, uh, as well as, as the town manager indicated, the, the university to put together all the pieces uh, post town meeting acceptance of the, uh, of the uh, public way. So we've gotta have all the assurances in place that HAP's funding is, is there and solid uh, and, and move forward from there. Um, so, Again, I think most of this would happen this fall, and then um, uh, we would look for construction sometime in uh, late spring 2013. Thank you. Questions or comments from Select Board for Mr. Zomack or Ms. Musanti? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, so just, just in a nutshell, if, if the work isn't complete by next spring, then we can say, oh, nope, sorry, we stop now. There are still some details to be wor worked out. As the memo indicated, we have four months um, after the vote at town meeting uh, to make sure all of those pieces are in place. So um, we would hope that we would not have to do this process again, but there is a remote possibility that that could happen. Um, so in the meantime, the town manager uh, and I working with town council will move all those pieces together and, and uh, move the, uh, with UMass on the legislation. So. Yeah, well, it seems uh, like a great thing, I, I have to say. No. Thank you. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Anyone else questions or comments on this Olympia Drive issue? Okay, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the Select Board vote its intention to lay out Olympia Drive and Authority Way as town ways as shown on a plan entitled Roadway Acceptance Plan, Olympia Drive and Authority Way, Amherst MA, dated August 23rd, 2012, prepared by Doucet and Associates Incorporated, and that the select board forward the layout petition and plan to the planning board for its comments and recommendations pursuant to general laws, chapter 41, sections 81G and 81, I, I, <laughs> I am not sure if that's an H or two I's. I meant to look it up, but I ran out of time. It's 81 I. I. Okay. Oh, I see. Yes, 81 I. Second. Further discussion? 
So I'll just note that this is um, this is this process is sort of a technicality, but one that we clearly have to go through to make everything be correct. Um, so folks will be hearing a lot more about this at the various stages that it goes through down the line, most particularly town meeting. All right, for the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. So then I'll work with the town manager's office and we'll get the appropriate uh, memo to the planning board. They tentatively have this on their uh, agenda for October 3rd. Okay, terrific. <clears throat> so we have things to sign in there tonight related to this, I think. Yes. Okay, so you don't need those at this moment. You can get them tomorrow or whatever. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you for the information and thank you for coming in. Okay, next up we have 655 is uh, back to school update initiatives and issues. So back when I was planning to do this, I didn't realize all the other things that were going to consume me over the last two weeks. Um, so I don't have quite the memo for you that I would have liked to have provided tonight, but I did want to give kind of a background so people understand what's going on. Um, in relation to uh, off-campus behavior issues and various UMass uh, things, just to kind of give some context for for what the year is going to look like. So um, I, I still mean to turn this into a, a more formal form that I can give out to all of you because I think it's an important reference to have. Um, so just as sort of a, a way of introduction to uh, to what's going on with the university's efforts and the town's efforts uh, per off-campus stuff. Um, first of all, I wanted to give a little bit of background so people understand the context in which we're having these discussions. Uh, a lot of things changed starting in the winter of 2011. And at that time, the Municipal Strategies Subcommittee of the Campus and Co uh, Community Coalition started advocating to the administration at the university to make the code of student conduct apply to off-campus behavior as well as on-campus behavior. Um, that had been fairly ambiguous before. Uh, it is now quite unambiguous. That change was accepted. There were wording changes, there were policy changes, and that became official in the spring of 2011. So last school year was the first school year that we've had with, the, with that being in full operation. Uh, in the fall of 2011, uh, that was the first year with that very explicit message. There was also new personnel in the Dean of Students office. Uh, the Dean herself, Dean of Students Enku Galai, as well as what I believe was a new position at that time, which was an Associate Dean for off-campus and graduate students. So that was devoting new personnel entirely to, uh, to these issues. Um, that was also, fall of 2011, was the first year of the expanded new student orientation, and this is an orientation program that happens during the fall, uh, rather during the summer, as well as in the fall. And the fall component had, starting last year, them bringing uh, first year students onto campus several days early so they could have all kinds of activities to uh, acclimate them to the university and educate them about what it meant to be a UMass student both on campus and off campus. Uh, lots of messaging happens at those uh, as far as laws and policies and expectations and consequences. Uh, and the convocation that happens during that event includes all of the students taking a pledge together about what it means to be um, good student citizens uh, of the campus and the larger community, and that includes a pinning ceremony, et cetera. Um, so this has now been two incoming freshman classes with this new class this year. That's two classes who have been through that whole new student orientation changeover uh, and kind of the new messaging and the new activities that are associated with that. So. Uh, so it will take two more years until the full student body has essentially gone through that process. Um, also, in the fall of 2011, they created for the first time an off-campus student center, and this is a way of staying in touch with off-campus students to try and uh, keep them feeling very connected to the university, but is also a very uh, important channel of communication to them about policies, expectations, etc. Also starting uh, in the fall of 2011, and this was really in direct response to uh, the town of Amherst and in particular the Amherst Police Department. Um, they've created a, an, a, 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 they call it um, UMass Night Out. And so these are activities on campus. They're now happening the first Friday of every month. And this was, uh, as I said, in response to feedback from the town 
In particular, the officers in the Amherst Police Department were hearing from students that when they were interacting with them in, in off-campus situations that there just wasn't anything happening on campus. Like they had to be off-campus looking for other options because because uh, there weren't other options. Um, so that was created last year. So now we're in our, our second year of that. We've had a full year of that and that has really been expanded. Um, so that brings us to fall of 2012. Uh, the, uh, this year, the, the new student orientation that I talked about was combined with transfer student orientation. So there's a significant number of, of students who transfer to the University of Massachusetts every year. Those folks were previously kind of not, not being part of all the same messaging as new students. So that has been combined for this year. That off-campus student center that they created last year is now not just an administrative office, but it is a uh, expanded, renovated, uh, hugely expanded in concept, uh, essentially a lounge in the in the student union that um, that is really a place for for those folks to connect, really be a resource for each other. There's a whole uh, social networking component to it. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, they also, in the fall of 2012, the university has created these off-campus student life coordinator positions, and this is brand new. They've hired five students to be living in the neighborhoods to help the uh, other students, the off-campus students, kind of learn what it is to be off-campus uh, citizens and, and help them navigate that. Those positions are still really kind of developing as far as, as what they're going to do and uh, whether they're also going to be a resource to the neighbors themselves or whether there's more of a, a resource to the students. But, um, but that is a really interesting uh, and wonderful development that the university is doing and in part modeling it after what has been very successful in other uh, college communities. Um, so I wanted to talk about all of those things because I think that uh, there's an awful lot of attention that goes into these efforts. Uh, myself, uh, Mr. Musanti, uh, the police department, all kinds of members of town staff trying to deal with these issues in many different ways, dealing with the university in many different ways. And I don't think we do a good enough job putting this information out there to folks. So this is kind of mostly the university-centered part of it. Um, there have been all kinds of other efforts on the town's behalf. Um, the police department is particularly effective and thorough in really going door to door in the uh, high student rental neighborhoods, being very clear with the students what the expectations are, what the laws are, et cetera. Um, and so those efforts have really expanded. Next year, we're looking to have our police department actually be part of the new student orientation so that uh, the chief or his designate could help to welcome those students to campus and uh, mm -hmm. and to the community and let them know what expectations are. Um, so this is this is kind of as far as I got before I ran out of time on my memo. But this <laughs> is the kind of thing that I want to be uh, doing a better job of of presenting to folks. The other thing that I wanted to talk about very quickly in relation to this is how the discipline process works. Every single dealing that the Amherst Police Department has with uh, with a student off campus um, that results in a ticket or an arrest or something like that is reported to the Dean of Students office. The Dean of Students follows up on every single report that they get. They do an investigation and reports can come not just from the Dean of Students office, they could come from neighbors, they could come from anybody who is dealing uh, specifically with, with students in a problem situation. Um, what the Dean of Students office needs, of course, is specifics. They don't respond to like, oh, this house is really noisy or whatever, but if you give them specifics um, and, and if it generates either a report on your half or uh, by the police department, then that all gets followed up on. Uh, so every, every student that deals with that is touched, if you will, by the Dean of Students Office, and they have their own processes for what happens. Um, the first step, of, of course, is, is educational. A lot of times the students just don't recognize that what they did had uh, negative impacts on folks, and so they do different things to try and educate them about that. The worse the infraction, then obviously the worse the sanction. And there has been uh, a real uptick in the suspensions and expulsions that are happening at the university. What the university is trying to do now is find a way to quantify those disciplinary numbers and report those to folks because, again, that has been something that is effective in 
deterring bad behavior uh, by the students, and it's such a critical thing for the community to know about follow-up. So they are working on how to do that right now. They've been working on that for uh, since last year, and, and I expect you're going to start hearing more about that this year. Um, so all of that being said, we know that we've also had sort of a tough start to the semester. Some of that is to be expected, and some of it is disappointing, considering all of the efforts that we have going on here. But I want folks to know what a serious priority this is on behalf of the town as well as the university, and that the steps that are being taken to address it are often fairly invisible. Some of that invisibility is just because, like, we can't how do we talk about everything here at a select board meeting? And if we're not talking about it here, then where are we talking about it? Um, but we need to find other ways to talk about it. Another part of the invisibility is there are privacy issues, of course, surrounding um, students, just as there are surrounding anybody. Um, so it, the university is not able to be specific about, you know, Joe Schmo got in trouble for whatever, and here's how he was punished. That is simply um, information that's protected by federal law. But the university is very aware that the, that the community is looking for, needs to know what kinds of follow-up is happening. So I wanted to give just sort of a general um, introduction to that stuff right now. Um, and, and we'll be talking a lot more about it as, as we do every week and as the weeks go by. What I usually do is I talk about these things during the member reports um, under my, my liaison report for Campus and Community Coalition. Often that's too late in the evening, so I'm kind of sh doing my report in shorthand and we're all kind of falling asleep and we're trying to get out of here. I'm going to try and do this, especially to present it in, in writing um, so that it becomes a, a resource document and that it maybe happens earlier in the evening. Um, also, we talked last time uh, about Mr. Musanti is going to be giving regular updates on the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative, the stuff that's specifically happening within Town Hall to be dealing with these things. Um, so this is all part of, of better educating the community about stuff that's going on. Um, would you like to say anything about the, kind of the issues we've had so far this semester? Or uh, sure, and thanks. That was an ex excellent, excellent uh, uh, summary. And as you said, there's many components to addressing some of the uh, issues that arise uh, from uh, our, our, our uh, thriving as a college town. Um, and you mentioned education and communication, and uh, but also uh, enforcement. And so. Uh, um, with the start of the fall semester, uh, you know, we had a, a, an uptick in activity that in many respects is not unusual, uh, a little more disappointing this year because of the, the other initiatives that have been made. Uh, for example, we had uh, 46 uh, summons arrests over the weekend. Uh, we had uh, 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 an uptick in, in uh, ambulance-related calls. Uh, we did have uh, increased staffing, which we do strategically during the academic year, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday evenings. Uh, and that's most appropriate as we try to put our public safety dollars to the most effective use. Uh, uh, there's still uh, a lot of efforts going on. Uh, we did ha get some feedback from officers, for example, uh, in the uh, Phillips Street neighborhood near the university that uh, there were housemates uh, uh, on the front porch in many respects. Uh, uh, Friday evening, for example, uh, telling the many passers-by uh, that there was no, uh, no party going on and uh, uh, people went on their merry way. We have noticed at the beginning of this semester there seemed to be more, uh, more uh, pedestrians out there. Uh, in the evening hours, and so that's part of our ongoing dialogue with neighbors and with uh, college officials and uh, public safety personnel to uh, uh, better understand that and really fulfill uh, an enforcement role, but also at the same time knowing that a, a large part of our, our public safety effort is in the form of prevention. So we're, we're working at it. It's hard, uh, but we're, we're, we're committed to it.
Thank you very much. And I'll just add one thing uh, before I take comment, if anyone would like to comment. Um, a, a lot of the efforts have been directed at the kids who live off campus. Um, what we've found is that we have to make sure that we're also directing these efforts to the kids who live on campus but are going off campus for their, uh, their activities. Um, so there has been a, a real increase in how we're getting this information to residents' life on campus and there's going to be essentially kind of its own targeted campaign to the uh, to the residents life staff about these these issues of of being respectful and quiet when you're going through the neighborhoods thinking about the fact that these are you know families who who live in these houses people have to get up in the morning kids have to go to school uh, etc so um, there's 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 more of this that's happening than I can be talking about in specifics uh, in this short amount of time but I just wanted to to give folks some context for, for how very much is happening and let you know that we're always trying to improve. It's always about trying to see how we, how we um, can do this better. And it really is challenging when you think of the fact that 25% of the student body turns over every year. So, uh, so it's always new lessons to new people. Um, so uh, questions or comments on any of this from the select board? Ms. Brewer couple of things. First of all, our heartfelt thanks for the amount of time that and effort that you've put into this. You've added on at least another part-time job's worth of uh, time on this that wasn't being spent by previous select boards on a regular basis, certainly not during the time I was paying attention and before I just joined the board. So um, I appreciate all the extra effort associated with that. And I have to say that also because I'm going to ask a couple questions. But, um, but also just it's an amazing effort. And I really appreciate the fact that the university is working so closely with you and with town staff so that it's not just they're telling us what they're doing, but that they're actually working together and interacting, I think, in a much yep. more effective way than has been done in a long time. Along those lines, one of the things I think that because of the turnover and the ch slight changes in the way they're approaching things that I think they haven't been very effective at explaining and maybe they could do a little bit better job so that you could continue to explain it to people is um, for one is I appreciate very much what you said about attempting to quantify the uh, expulsions and suspensions to really we people want to hear that yes people have been said you can't do this anymore you just have to leave and obviously there are the privacy <coughs> concerns so I think it, you know if you could just remind them how much we appreciate that because when we hear about a process that talks about you know each of these is followed up well, what were they doing five years ago? What were they doing 10 years ago? Tell us that 10 years ago, you know what? We didn't do anything with it because we didn't know what to do. I mean, I think there's an acknowledgement piece there that hasn't happened on the university's part because obviously no one wants to look uncomfortable, but there has to have been a change in the way that it's being approached. And I think that they should feel proud of the fact that they've decided to reconsider in light of all things, um, that they are now taking things differently. Not that they didn't take them seriously, but they seem to be following through in a different way. Also along those lines is, although I totally appreciate and I'm very excited to see the information about the off-campus student <coughs> center, the fact that it's a last, they had one of those. They called it something else for decades. It was a commuter resources office. You could go in, you could find out where your housing was, you could join an oil co-op, you could find out about part-time jobs. I mean, it was, it was a, a drop-in place. Again, when they say, oh, we have this new off-campus students, it's, well, what was that thing that you had for years and years, and why is this better? You know, this is even more. It's not just a bunch of notebooks and a couple people talking about landlord-tenant law, which was the other thing they did, um, but it's even better, and it's even more useful to students. So I think if they would take a little bit of their own history and explain to people why now is different, I think that would help people ex a lot. And a comment for the town manager associated with um, the pedestrians, one of the other things I think we're starting to hear more and more and hopefully will also be addressed by somewhat by our taxi regulations changing in January is that I'm hearing more and more from people who get stressed out not only about the number of crowds of students walking but the taxis that are building up in various parts of town they don't you know, it's like suddenly we didn't have taxis before how did kids get there before we don't quite know how this works but it seems to be adding to the impact some neighborhoods are feeling associated with that so that's something to take into account obviously as we discuss the taxis but also 
I don't know quite what to do with it, but if there's if there's something in some parts of town where we might need more of a drop-off area or a pickup area or something, it's um, it's starting to cause some stress. Now, if it turns out we only have three taxi companies left after we change our regulations, then I guess it won't be an issue as much, but it could potentially still be out there. We appreciate people driving together, yet <laughs> at the same time, it's a concern. Thank you very much. That's the first I've heard about a taxi. Um, issues in that way so I appreciate that very much um, and to your other point about uh, there really has been just so much change in the administration at the last couple of years at, at very high levels and in many different offices uh, and you know like anything the university is a very large bureaucracy and it has a long and storied past and uh, and this really is representing a cultural shift within the university and it's interesting when we talk with folks from the dean of students office about accountability you know they're, they're holding a kid accountable and they suddenly get all these phone calls from you know parents uh, all kinds of alumni saying oh come on now you know it, this we did stuff like this when I was there you know legislators lawyers of course everybody calls their lawyer for anything today um, so and and interestingly even sometimes professors because really this isn't it, it takes time to change the the culture and the expectations on campus and uh, so uh, so it's it's been really fascinating um, so keep the feedback coming um, anybody else from uh, first the select board want to comment or question anything about this Okay, anyone from the public want to comment about this? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, and uh, you'll be hearing more about that. Next up, new business licenses. We have a food truck, El Saeed <coughs> Fabdel Glil for Halal Food. Please come forward. I apologize for how poorly I must have pronounced your name. So if you could say it better, that would be great. <laughs> that was much better. Um, so you are... <laughs> <laughs> you can sit. Um, so you are going to have a food truck doing business as Halal Foods, and we yeah. have your application information. Um, so where are you planning on operating? And He was right here at the, in the street right here by, I forget the name of the street. North Pleasant Street yeah. and Main Street. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And is this a new business for you, or just new in Amherst? You know, I, I, was, I, used, to do, I used to do it in New York, and I worked over there like almost like eight years. And I have one of my cousins, he used to be in the college over here, and he told me about it. And he, you know, told me if you want to do it like a little lunch car over here. And I come and see the area, and I say, you know, I can like to do like a new business over here. Very good. Um, so we know from past food truck licenses, which suddenly we're having more of, we had like never done this before in the last year, we've had several, um, that we really don't have a lot of jurisdiction over these. Um, they, when you have the, um, the state license that's required, you basically get a license from the town saying, yes, okay, um, but there's, there's really uh, almost nothing we can do to limit it, so, uh, so just so folks know that. Does anyone have any questions? for this gentleman about his new food truck, Ms. Stein, and then Mr. Walt. Um, I don't see the hours of operation on this um, motion, so I was wondering. It's possible that's hours. something we can't regulate, but we'll see. So but do you know your hours of operation? It was, I think it was from 11 to 11. 11 to 11? Yeah. Because it is on some motions and not on others. And mm -hmm. so on it was these, never yeah. clear if, okay. if that was <coughs> a formal thing. Or so we can add 11 to 11 for this one? And Mr. Wald? Just a, a comment that it's nice to see this because in recent years we've seen more and more halal food in regular grocery stores, so it's nice to see it in the food truck too to serve the growing Muslim population. Mm -hmm. Welcome that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board approve a lunch cart license for El Sayed F. Abdel Glil, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, it's all right. Um, doing business as Halal Food to operate from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. within the public way on the corners of North Pleasant and Amity Street and Kellogg Avenue and North Pleasant Street, pending issuance until any slash all outstanding town department regulations have been satisfied. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Good luck. And we will look forward to trying your food. All right. Next up, then, we have another food truck license, Matthew Rathburn for Happy Hour Hot Dogs. 
Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And so let's see, I already said your name is Matthew Rathburn, which yep. I'm assuming I've pronounced correctly. You did. <laughs> that was much easier. <laughs> um, so tell us about your hot dog business. Um, it's a mobile food cart. I built it myself. It's about four feet by five feet long. I included pictures in the application. I'm not sure if it made its way to you. I don't think we got them. But, um, it's just basically a little food cart, a little bit bigger than this, double the width. It's got an umbrella with some lights around it. And uh, it's just basic hot dogs, soda, water, and um, potato chips, things like that. And so this is one that you use on the sidewalk as opposed to on the street? Yes, it's on a trailer, but it's very small, so it, I can push it around myself. It's very light. And um, it could fit on the sidewalk, it could fit in a parking space, you know, whatever's easiest. But it's very mobile, and it's very small. Okay, so you understand you can't be blocking the sidewalk in the public way, and um, there could be times that if you were outside, directly outside of a restaurant, they could ask you to move along to somewhere. Um, so it's, <coughs> it's, uh, it's really about not blocking the sidewalk part in particular. Okay. Okay. Um, so we do have a little bit more regulation over these because it is a sidewalk thing. So do people have other issues with where he is on the sidewalk. Ms. Stein. Uh, not so much where it is on the sidewalk, but I was wondering how you keep the food cold. Oh, there's the, um, it, I don't, did you get the picture? No. Oh, okay, so what it is, is it's got the grill where you steam and everything, and then there's a um, cooler inside the car. There's a few coolers inside of it. Okay, so it, and that's kept cool by ice because you can't plug it in. Uh, it's it's a, a battery. No, um, it's a very thick cooler, and there's packs that go inside it, and the packs can keep things cool for up to two weeks. Okay. And I only need it for one night per shot, so yeah, <laughs> it usually Thank works you. out. Ms. Brewer, um, although we clearly don't know as much as we might know about lunch cart licenses, which has nothing to do with the lovely applicants we have this evening, I think it is clear that there's a town of Amherst health permit associated with that. So although satisfying our curiosity is always something we enjoy doing, um, clearly the Board of Health must have thought that the cooling was acceptable or they would not have done their part of this. So that's why we vote on these basically with this new language, you know, that all the other regulations <coughs> that are like real regulations, like Board of Health regulations, whereas our regulations seem to be zero associated with this. We don't seem to be able to control the hours and obviously the sidewalk part of it would must be up to the police to you know keep a free flow of traffic kind of thing right it's the health department not the board of health because okay. as lee is on yes. the board of health well, i good. guarantee okay. we've never town discussed town of them. amherst health permit you're right okay sorry all I'm right sorry. i say i'd never seen these <laughs> other questions or comments from select board all right anyone all right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? I move that the select board approve a lunch cart license for Matthew <coughs> Rathform doing business as Happy Hour Hot Dogs within the public way in front of 54 North Pleasant Street, Amherst, MA, from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m., pending issuance until any slash all outstanding town department regulations have been satisfied. Second. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. <coughs> Ms. Brewer, did you vote? Yeah. Oh. Yes, she voted Thank unanimously. You. Um, Question. Uh, she would just ask the town manager to add this to Ms. Roussel's long list of many regulations she's trying to sort out for us. Just to have, if we have a, what are we doing here? I mean, if we just say yes because everybody else said yes, that's fine. But if we actually do get control of the hours or we do get control of a particular intersection, that'd be fine to know. But in the meantime, it's like, whatever yeah. <laughs> so. I think I think we have one of those from the past that I should have asked to have included just even to refresh. but if there's like a checklist of like you can control this yeah. thing but you can't control these 12 things so don't even bother <laughs> talking about those 12 right. aspects that'd be great but we know that all of our people that are town staff have done all the stuff they need to do so all right. right it's been moved second and voted we're all set you're all set congratulations good luck and thank you very much for coming in all right do we have someone here from Jay Gumbo's no one from Jay Gumbo's for the common victualler's license. Okay, so uh, we had thought that these folks were going to come in, but common victualler's licenses, like mm -hmm. a lot of these, they don't necessarily have to come in. We try and bring everybody in who's a, a new business um, in particular. Well, A, so we can ask them questions, but also so that they have an opportunity to kind of introduce themselves to the public. Um, but what we had found with common victualler's for a long time was that the uh, places were opening before they had come to us for that license. So because it's more important to us that they are appropriately licensed than that they come in, because we're never gonna reject a common vigilance license once it's recommended to us for approval, um, 
then typically we just deal with these even if the folks aren't here. So that way they don't open without the license. So uh, I will note that J Gumbo's is located where uh, the Amherst Crepery was most recently on North Pleasant Street. Um, and, uh, and they look to be opening very soon. Um, so that's all I know about them. <laughs> Questions or comments that I won't be able to answer. Okay, Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? I move that the select board approve a common victuals license for Pilot Investment LLC doing business as J Gumbos at 19 North Pleasant Street, Amherst, MA, with hours of operation 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday and 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Sundays. Client Sirwar. Um, manager until any slash all outstanding town department regulations have been satisfied. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Eden. I just want to just note that in, in all of these cases and amongst all of the other food vendors in town, the health department will be visiting them and will let us know if there's a problem. Absolutely. That's true. Uh, Mr. Musanti. I would just suggest you add the words after uh, the manager's name, uh, Pending Thank issuance. Thank you. I knew something I was like missing that much there. <laughs> until. Yeah. I was like, wait. Yeah. Manager until outstanding. Yeah, all that cut and paste didn't quite work out. <laughs> okay, Ms. Burke. Okay, could we do I, that for all, all of them? They all say that. They, they all, all do, do except, except for that, that one. one. We just yeah. didn't quite make it in for this one. See how it says pending issuance until? Okay. So it's that same phrase. Got it. The, um, I just wanted to mention quickly that it, it is a franchise, and you can look it up online. If you want to find out what it is before oh. they get here, I think they've already Thank put you. menus up, but um, to know. it's out there. All right, uh, I've lost track. That was for the discussion. We haven't voted yet, right? Right, we didn't vote okay. because we added <laughs> those Second words. Issue. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Aye, that's unanimous. Thank you. All right, how's our timing? Thank you for catching that. 726. All right, good. Um, so our 725 item then as we have a number of town manager evaluation performance goal things to deal with. Um, the first one is relation to the evaluation um, from this year. Following the last meeting's discussion of uh, Mr. Musanti's performance evaluation, we went into executive session and we agreed on three changes to his contract which have all been announced and been in the paper. Uh, he is going to have the term of his contract changed from what we called a rolling three-year contract to a rolling five-year contract. Uh, he is going to get a one and a half percent salary increase and we are changing the cap on his long-term disability insurance so that it can uh, adjust with periodic rate increases. Uh, and that's just a reimbursement that he gets from the town for whatever amount he needs to pay on that. Um, so we need to vote on those in open session in order to make all of those official. Does anybody have any questions about what we're doing or what we agreed to? Any questions from anyone about this? All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make those motions? I move that the select board approve the draft forms and process for That's the town not it actually. Is I'm that sorry. the one? No, it isn't. Sorry. No, I don't know. Isn't oh, we it? don't have a. It's not a vote on the contract. It's just here for a <laughs> We don't vote on the contract. I think we do have to. Yeah. Vote. Open session. Absolutely. So I'll you just make up a it. vote. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we need to vote in yeah. well, open session. So anyway, so I move okay. that the select board approve the new town manager's contract with a rolling five-year plan and the one and a half percent increase in salary. And the and change disability. to the disability. And the change to the insurance disability reimbursement. Insurance. Yeah. Second. Further discussion. Ms. Burr. And just to remind the public again that all those documents, as you've said now a thousand times, are online. And we, this is, uh, you know, a continuation of a discussion from executive session. It is, and so all that good stuff that's in the evaluation supports why we're doing this. So Correct. it's all out there and on the website. Yes, those who tune in on a weekly basis who really need a new hobby, or as my <laughs> husband would say, a better cable package. <laughs> um, they've been following this for a long time and, and know all those documents. Okay, uh, that's been moved and seconded. Did we vote? I'm sorry, my Not mind yet. is wandering. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Thank you. 
Next, we have renew, review the evaluation process for future improvement. So this is something that we try and do every year uh, after we finish up our very long uh, uh, and uh, iterative process, we look back and see, okay, how do we do it better next time? And we try and do it when everything is kind of fresh in our minds. So I open the floor to the select board to comment on anything about the evaluation process that they would like to see us improve for this year. Ms. Brewer. So one of the things that we touched on during our last discussion in open session associated with the process is whether or not um, just to make the uh, the next chair isn't as brilliantly creative as you are about figuring out what we actually meant when we said various things in various parts of the box. We should probably come to some shared agreement, if you don't mind me stealing your box for a moment, no, as to whether or not when something has subheadings within a box, if you're supposed to rate each one of the items separately, or if there is a rating per box, because when you're trying to convert it into something else, it makes it a little trickier to do. So do we need to break things into finer pieces, or we, can we vote within them? Because if nothing else, I don't really care how we do it, but I would never have considered that we should do them separately within a box. That just did not occur to me. It was like one box, one vote. Other people clearly didn't feel that way. So just so that we all know when we're filling out the form what we all should be doing, that would be awesome. Okay, so, uh, so folks who are following along know what we're talking about. This is specifically to the select board's evaluation form itself and how we interpret the, um, when we do our goals, some of the goals are, are multi-part, part A, B, C, D. Uh, some of us give a, a single answer for those multi-parts and some of us break it into the uh, a grade per A, B, C, and D. Thank you, that was much clearer. Ms. Stein. I'm one of the people who breaks it into parts because to me, each part is somewhat different. And um, if the way it's done with, with points A, B, C, and D makes it seem like I should answer point 1A and 1B and 1C and 1D and not do it cumulatively, and I don't mind doing it that way. Um, if it creates problems for you when you're trying to summarize across the board, then I can change my procedures. <laughs> Not a problem for me whatsoever. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, ha I'm happy to, to, to find a way to interpret what folks have done. Um, how, do other folks have strong feelings about this one way or the other? Mr. Hayden. Strong, I don't know, but feelings indeed. The, the, um, um, the same quandary, we all had it, um, and I believe I went both ways in my, uh, in my evaluation. Uh, some of them I read separately. Um, as much as a rhetorical device, um, you know, you, you use the tools that you have at hand to try to get the point across that, <clears throat> yes, this is something we really like and we want more of it, and oh, here's a little thing, and maybe we want a little different tack on that. So it, it's, it's, I'm afraid it's a very human process, no matter how many boxes and how small those boxes get. Indeed. Other thoughts about this particular issue? Um, so I'll note that, um, as I've said before, the. Uh, the, the form is a very inexact instrument that, that tries to catch a wide <clears throat> net and really just um, capture as much reaction from all of us <clears throat> as possible, and then it's, it's about interpreting that. So on the one hand, I, I wouldn't tend to get too um, concerned about any little detail of it. At the same time, uh, it, it wouldn't hurt for us to all try doing it that way next year, and we'll, if, if, if we don't like it, we can go back or something. So. Can we, can we give it a shot? We can agree to try to, to do all, all the parts of it right. next year, and I'll just note that down for something that we would then, I would remind us of when we do this again next summer, which will be here before we know it. Mr. Hayden. <laughs> I just want to uh, draw our attention and, and, and be reminded of why there are big boxes and little boxes. We do have the <coughs> goals that we spend a lot of time with, I mean that's what's important in all of this, you know, whether it's four boxes or two, or you put one check or seven. Um, the, the, I think the part that, that we could be most um, uh, happy with is, you know, those, those half a dozen um, specifically and general goals that we've set for uh, the town manager. Something, um, you know, I, I'm feeling that, um, you know, the big boxes with those goals in them, which are broken out in various aspects, are the thing that 
you know, uh, the town manager can sink his teeth into. They're the things that we'll, we're looking for. Nuances here and there, but this is what we're looking for. So. Okay. All right, so we're good agreeing that we'll all try and do that next year, and I'll note that down. Yeah. Okay. Anything else about the instrument, as we call it, the form process? So I'll note that one of the things we talked about is the staff feedback. Um, so this year we sent out 230 something staff uh, feedback forms. We got back 30 of them. Um, and so then we wonder, of course, how representative that is and, and what we should make of that information. Um, one of the things we had talked about last year uh, before we did the 2011 evaluation was to <coughs> ask the staff afterwards what we could do to try and improve the feedback, what would make the form more useful to them and increase the likelihood of their, of their uh, returning it. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Musanti uh, had a little accident right about that time and suddenly that was not the most important or relevant thing to be doing and seemed like a strange environment to be, uh, to be going through that process. So we just skipped it and waited till this year. Um, so we could do that this year. The other thing that I was thinking is um, we have mentioned how uh, we had the new human resources director now and maybe before we send out a, any kind of questionnaire to the staff, maybe I sit down with her, kind of go through all of the pieces that we have, get her reactions to them, see what she thinks the strengths and weaknesses are of our process, uh, and then bring those thoughts to, to the select board and see if there's something actionable from there. So rather than just going ahead and sending out something to staff right now, if that was her recommendation, then she could help shape, you know, what that would be and whatever. How does that sound, Mr. Hayden? That, that sounds that sounds uh, like what what I would would want and expect. I did just sort of want to uh, mention uh, the thought that one of the issues that comes up with any kind of questionnaire or survey is whether or not the questions are appropriate to the population, and um, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a suggestion for this, just an understanding that um, we expect a different um, interaction between the town manager and different populations of people who, who work here. Um, you know, for some it's a daily interaction, some it's a weekly, some it's, it's, it's a little more supervisory, you know. Um, and I'm hoping that, we can, that uh, we can tease that out with our new Deb. Okay. Uh, other thoughts on that? Ms. Stein. I was just going to say, I sort of kept track of the 15 questions, and the first five, most people were able to make a comment without checking unable to judge, and also nine. And after that, six, seven, eight, and 10 through 15, seems like those were questions that a certain group of staff at least felt unable to judge. And I think Deb's input on this will be extremely helpful. Um, you know, they, they may be perfectly good questions for a subset. And we may just have to accept the fact that a certain number will say they can't judge because they don't have that particular interaction or whatever. Right. Right. And so, yeah, it'll be interesting to get her feedback is, is part of the problem that we're, we're asking people to rate as opposed to maybe if they were all open-ended, <laughs> you know, and, and we're looking for sort of sentence answers, maybe that would be better or maybe that'd be worse because nobody wants to do that. Who knows? So um, I, I think getting her perspective would be good before we kind of um, make a big change there. Ms. Brewer. I agree. And I, and I very much want these pieces of information to be provided to her when we're asking for that perspective. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, what Aaron was saying about the differences, what about the specific questions that Diana just brought up, sure. and of course my brilliant idea, which is um, something more along the lines of, and again, just to put into the hopper sort of thing, what's the town manager doing particularly well? What's something the town manager could do better? Just those two, you know, mm. that's sort of the opposite of what we've been doing <clears throat> and so somewhere between all these places we may be able to come up with something and I also think that we should feel open to different groups depending on how people might self-define um, could have different types of questionnaires as well there isn't like you know 
the robin and the blackbird <clears throat> questionnaires, but there's like there could be differences depending on if his department heads maybe should be asked a slightly different set of questions, and then we'd know it was all from department heads, and that'd be fine. Or if people that you know that see him less, for example, just because that's their day-to-day -day jobs, maybe something that's more open-ended. You know, what's not? What are they? What's the worst or best? But <laughs> something that's done particularly well, something that could be done better. And it may turn out to not even be a town manager task, which is also something we do occasionally see referenced in our written comments. It's not clear to me that sometimes <clears throat> people know what the town manager's role is, and so he's criticized for something that really isn't under his control anyway. So um, we should be open to possibilities and, and the idea that it's kind of an ongoing pilot you know that it's not done like you say it's always in flux and that we're always just trying to do better not just like this is the questionnaire we will use for the next 10 years mm -hmm. okay so i will uh talk Thank with you. mr Roussel and and i don't know when it won't be for the next meeting but uh before too long i'll bring you back some great results from that mr hayden just to follow up on 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 the comment a, a recollection i i wanted to um recall that the, the sentences that we got on those questionnaires were amongst the most helpful piece of information, certainly the most complete. It's, um, it's a little bit of a problem, and I also sort of remember that it's a bit of a problem because not everybody communicates with a pen and pencil. In the, that's not, for some, that's not their most effective way to communicate, and I don't know how to address and get to the other ones as well. Check boxes are good for some people. One-to-one -one is best for others. Right. Thank Paintball, you. you know, things like that. <laughs> Paintball. All right, other thoughts on this? All right, anything else then about the process this year? <coughs> I thought the timing and everything of it went pretty well. Oh, speaking of timing, I, I mentioned to the audience that um, some stuff got changed on our agenda and uh, not all the timing changes carried through. So um, <coughs> the town manager's report will is probably not going to start on time at 7.45. I had been planning it for 7.55, but that didn't make it all the way through. But we will get to it just as soon as we get to it. So I apologize and thank you for your patience. Um, okay, <clears throat> so then I'll work on that part for the, uh, for the staff part and we will, unless we have other thoughts on this now, we'll save those for when we preview the process <laughs> before we do it next year. Ms. Brewer. Just on one other aspect of our process, I think we're in great shape in the direction on that. And once again, thank you, Madam Chairperson, for having that conversation so that we don't have to, um, is in regards to the other, out, the other outreach that we do to committee chairs and um, town meeting members, which gets almost no response. And I, at this point, figure, oh well, I, I think it's good that we do it. I still think it's good that we go ahead and do that outreach. I'm not sure it's really gaining us much, but I think it's just another way of alerting the world to the fact that we're doing it. So although it's disappointing we don't get more feedback that way, it's probably a no news is good news situation, or at least I'll feel free to interpret it that way. And um, so I wouldn't, I, I guess my point is that's part of our process and I'm not concerned about that part of our process. I'm willing to just let it ride. Yeah, I, I think that that's going pretty well. And, and folks should know that of course we're interested in feedback all the time. Right. You know, so when we, when we send out that reminder about, um, about feedback specifically during that time period, that's to make <laughs> sure they get it into us if they want to. It doesn't mean that they couldn't have commented to us at any time previously during the year. So, uh, so it's just kind of a reminder for anybody who wants to participate. Okay, anything else on this then before we move on to goals? Okay, so then the next part of this is the FY13 town manager performance goals. So we have been talking about um, all summer long when we were having these discussions, we were having the, um, the goals discussion kind of in parallel with whatever step of the evaluation process that we were in because they are so kind of tightly aligned. Um, so we have at this point gone through several discussions of town manager performance goals and um, and a couple things have happened. One is that we decided to carry over all of the goals from last year 
unchanged as of the last conversation about it. We did not choose to add any new goals to this as of the last conversation about it. Uh, since that time, we did our big discussion about the evaluation specifics, and we found that on some of the goals, we realized that we need to be more clear. We need to have better shared expectations of what we're looking for from some of these goals before we can possibly hold the town manager accountable for them. So. We thought we were doing that all along, but it turns out we weren't, as was very obvious in how we all responded to that stuff. So, um, so thoughts related to that different, um, starting with that, that last point, different clarity that is needed from the existing goals that <coughs> we learned via the evaluation process, Ms. Brewer. Well, I know that um, on item, at least my last set of notes on this, on item nine, we were talking about uh, the recommended staffing plan which was not entirely clear on what our expectations were there in terms of is it, is it just more information in the big budget book? And the answer was actually no, that's not what we're looking for. Um, it was my understanding that it was more of a framework that is looking at what our fire department should look like given our current circumstances and what best practices are, not just our goals within the next year or our five years. It, it just doesn't feel like quite the same document, and I'm not sure I have a better way of describing that, but um, it's perhaps, yeah, it's not the same as what the extra words are in the big budget book. All right, so I, when I brought up this goal last year, um, my sense of it was that this would be a document that is sort of analogous to the open space and recreation plan, <laughs> you know, something that you actually can work with and plan from that is also analogous to the facilities report um, that would talk about, uh, especially in the context of having gone through such dramatic cuts in the last several years to deal with the budget crisis, um, what in, in today, in today's needs and circumstances, what is the right size of the staff for these various departments? And that it mentions in the goal that that would in part be in consultation with those staff. You know, so did your did your staff lose? Um, an administrative assistant and a, a professional during this downturn and is that working or it's not working do, do you are you still short an administrative assistant so that's something we should plan for obviously the bigger ones that we talk about are police and fire what what does that look like in a perfect world um, so that when we do our budget priority guidelines and so that when town meeting is dealing with the budget we're talking about new staff positions in some kind of a context and that we all have kind of a plan to refer to that we can say, okay, the, uh, you know, the fire department is short by optimally X number of people. So when a, when a new staffing opportunity comes up, you would see that you're, you're kind of trying to fill in the, fill in the gaps there. Um, I, I don't know if it can happen in the document or if it happens more depending on the circumstances that those would somehow be prioritized against each other so not just within a department that you know you need two people or you know you're fine or whatever but all right if this department is is short two people and this one is short one person where where do those <coughs> fall in relation to each other so it, it's basically to to get a sense of the staffing needs going forward so these things don't just kind of grow organically and by accident but with some purpose and so that we have the opportunity to take advantage of you know various funding opportunities that come along or whatever that all these conversations are happening in a context so i would <coughs> see this being very much a document a document that would be department by department with maybe a kind of an overall sense that probably will change over time. Maybe that overall part or maybe even the details within the department would be kind of constantly updated depending on the circumstance. Also like the kind of the JCPC five-year capital plan. Um, you know, at, at this, the, your, it, because everything is just a snapshot in time. So at this snapshot in time, here's what we think the staffing needs are. But of course, that's going to change with every, you know, month and year that we don't fill them. Um, so then we'll go to Mr. Musandi, but <coughs> is that, does that sound like something that we want and is reasonable or am I just pushing this and we think this is a stupid idea and we can forget about it? Mr. No. Hayden. No, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a valuable tool to, to try to, to create. Um, uh, I, I believe I may have given 
uh, Mr. Mazzani, the highest marks in this category because um, we already have, uh, at the beginning of this information, in the budget, if you actually read the narrative that comes with every department, um, it, it, um, there was often a paragraph about um, uh, staffing needs and the demands, you know, sort of how many, you know, how much is getting done or not getting done depending on who is there. That's sort of somewhere near the FTE line. So, um, I, I mean, it, it's not something that um, is not being attended to now. It is being attended to. It is being thought about. Um, just sort of the, what, what you were looking for, which was a little different, again, the clarity in that was a little different than I was looking for, was, was sort of this, the consolidation of it. And um, I, th I think we can agree that having consolidated is valuable, is, is useful. I'm not actually sure what I would expect that to look like, though, because unlike a, a, a capital plan or a, um, uh, a description of, you know, what uh, buildings we have and what state they're in, um, the demands are changing all the time. Job descriptions are changing. Sort of what a department has to handle is changing. Um, I mean, we're going we're gonna to find an example of that, um, I think, in a, in a planning board recommendation for the budget here down the road a little piece, for, for instance. So I just want to sort of give a little bit of leeway to figure out what it really looks like rather than a sort of a seven-part document with five subsections. Right, right. So uh, I think that I think that we could sort of see how this works, and you know, if it if it doesn't work, and and again, I'll ask you what you think of it in just a second. But um, <laughs> you know, if you start from this concept of giving it a plan and giving it some context, something that we can plan for and track and and prioritize as a community, you know, so that that's how you have a that's how you have a discussion about okay, we we need X number of more police <clears throat> officers. How does that compare to things? You can have that kind of discussion that way. Um, but it's also possible that it doesn't, of course, fit all neatly into a bunch of boxes like we would like it to. Ms. Stein. Um, I'm sitting here and thinking about the process and what actually happens. And I'm wondering if, if we could have two um, chances for John to respond. One in which he does a draft in which we could say, well, we think you could spell out goal nine a little better so that we get closer to what it is we're aiming for. Um, a draft of what? A draft of his response to our goals. We get it. He does a report for us as part of the evaluation process, mm -hmm. but that's it. I mean, he doesn't get a do-over. And what I'm suggesting is it might get us closer to what we're after if it came in two weeks earlier and we had a chance to say we'd like a little more flesh on these bones. Oh, oh, I see. So you're saying about his self-evaluation yes. itself. Yes. I'm trying to get okay. what he evaluates closer to our goals. I mean, it's a very good evaluation. I think, you know, mostly he touches on the points, but I think it's... You know, I gave him the highest marks for the people that got hired, but the plan wasn't there. You see what I'm saying? And I'd like a chance for him to be able to, for John to be able to say, well, this is, this is the plan. Okay, so that's kind of a timing and process issue right. on our right. end, at near the end of the right. process. So but I think, because I think what I'm saying, basically, I don't have any problem with the goals. What I want to make sure is that we get the optimal answers that we're looking for. Okay, I think I, I, I think I know what you're saying. And I also think that by being more clear now, so we're kind of spelling out <clears throat> now what we think that this should look like, and then, plus we have the, the progress reports as we go along, and we, that was a little bit abbreviated last year because he was right. out also. <laughs> we had the weirdest years. Um, but, uh, but yes, okay, so I, I understand what you're saying. Ms. Brewer. Yeah, because for a minute I was thinking maybe we needed to build in another step, but maybe not yet. Um, into the that's more of the evaluation process itself that maybe we need to build in that extra time sure. but maybe by being able to not have any weird interruptions in our year we can also spend a little more time on the quarterly reports and be able to say at that point you know I'm not really sure we're all talking about the same thing here um, 
because that can that can be hard to tell sometimes from the quarterly reports because of course it's a work in progress. The other part of it I wanted to mention is that I know it always feels like we're just asking for more, 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 more. I would I would say that probably. Um, based on not having read it again before I got here, but in the big budget book, that information does not need to be repeated in both places. And so we're, I think we could say that were this to happen this year, that we're going to have such a document that we don't need to keep, I, I personally do not find extreme value in the loads of text of the, the, of the way we would do the budget book now. I've encouraged us for years to take some of that out because a lot of it just feels like rehashing, cutting and pasting, long-term goals that we're not actually getting to, et cetera. And I, I see this as a more living, breathing document than that once a year, put it in a book and there it sits, and if somebody wants to go and look at it, fine. So I would encourage that, you know, if we can find a way that, you know, we always talk about what do we want as opposed to <clears throat> you figure out all the methods to get there, but if there's something that needs to fall by the wayside, that can fall, you know, that can be less important to me because that's not important to me. What's important to me is trying to get to this type of report that we're looking at. Mr. Musanti, so you've heard us talk about this goal now sure. for a while. Um, so what do you, what are you, your reactions to the concept and how you think it might be practically fulfilled? Uh, yeah, and I think the key word for all of us to keep in mind is practicality. Um, so that I'm spending the vast majority of my time on attempting to fulfill the goals and perhaps less time uh, self-reporting or draft self-reporting or putting together a preliminary draft of the draft of the self-reporting. Um, having said all that, um, the discussion is extremely helpful um, and I think this notion that some of the long-term objectives for the departmental uh, units that were articulated in the budget book. Uh, there was more information this last budget go around in there about staffing needs than there had been, I think, in uh, the last several years. Um, and I would agree with Mr. Hayden that that really is kind of a starting point, but doesn't, doesn't I think, get to what the board was looking at because it's part of a much larger uh, package of things, some of which are personnel related and many of which are not. Um, so this notion of periodically, uh, not necessarily every year, but periodically having some kind of distilled uh, articulation by the manager of staffing needs and priorities for the coming period uh, it would be helpful. So I, I see the budget stuff as a starting point, and uh, um, it's not an insignificant project to take it to the, that next uh, that next phase. But I think I think I'm hearing clearly that's what that that's what you're looking for, and that would be helpful as we consider grants and everything else uh, going forward about staffing needs. I think it will be really important, really helpful for town meeting to have a sense yeah. of we're doing all of this why <laughs> right. you know yep. it, it it gives more information about um trying to to meet the the future goals of whatever direction we're trying to go in so um i think i think it will be helpful so um so we so we've got this clarity on the concept do the words need to change or are the words good <laughs> enough now that we've had this conversation so I'll, I'll kind of summarize that part in the, in the list, the post-meeting list, saying that we agree that this is a document <laughs> or whatever and not, a, not just information from the budget report. Okay. Um, Ms. Greeny, you had your hand raised. Is it about this particular goal number nine? Uh, about the goals in general. Okay, I'm not going to call on you yet for that then, but I will call on you eventually. Okay, um, so then other issues with the goals one of them that we talked about was also needing clarification was the part about on 3b about actively engaging the community to gather information about strengths and weaknesses of municipal service delivery and again are, so are are we are we saying to him just in general that we hope you're being very diligent about municipal service delivery, or are we saying 
take steps. We want to know a, a, B, and C, the kinds of things that, that you, your staff, that, that town government has done to, uh, to get information from the public about service delivery. And so I, you can tell by how I'm asking this that I think it's the latter. <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but th this isn't the goals according to Stephanie, so <laughs> it has to be what we're jointly looking for. Ms. Stein. I presume that the many emails that Ms. Maria Santi gets from citizens talking about the strengths and weaknesses of the municipal system are, are the way he gathers information about it. I don't know that there's a process beyond that, but I think that's fine. It doesn't bother me as long as people know his email address and, and write to him. Um, I think that's acceptable. I'm not sure what else we're looking for. I mean, we've had in previous select board, um, in previous select boards, there was a system set up which didn't seem to work because the answers didn't go out and um, wasn't clear um, exactly sometimes to whom the particular complaint was going or the com particular issue. So I think the current system is fine. I don't think it needs to be formalized beyond that. So. I'm happy with it. So, so you would say basically we don't need 3B, and this could just be 3A, essentially reformatted. Well, I suppose we could always, just, you know, critique his response, or you know, I mean that gives you an opening. Um, but yeah, it would give you an opening to say whether he is answering responsibly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't think you need a formal, pro a more formal process. Okay, That's so, all I'm saying. So uh, the the example we always use for this was the suggestion box. <laughs> Were we looking right. for more than a suggestion box? Um, I feel the email is the modern day suggestion box. Okay, so I guess so. My reaction to that is that that is that is passive. You're waiting for people to reply mm -hmm. as opposed right. to actively seeking their response and exactly. and you know so either one is fine it's just a question of being clear which one we're looking for um yeah, take i'm going to go on this side first and then mr Burr, mr Walls. yeah i think there's more clarity would be useful there uh i think there's also some danger of confusing the questions are we looking at the delivery of services and citizen satisfaction or are we looking at mr Mizanti's response i don't those are totally separate questions and i think we're talking about the former there is some danger though of trying to have to invent a new system to accomplish that, because I would think that the emails are not very useful, because you get cranky emails from people who are irritated about something, or you get the occasional delighted email, but as you said, it's passive, it's not representative, and it's basically of analytical value zero. So I don't know. I would like to have better feedback on how the town delivers services, but I would be a little bit hesitant to try to invent a new system on the spot and put the burden on the town manager. So I'm not quite sure how to get from here to there. Okay. but. I think it is that we do need a more quantifiable, data-driven assessment of performance. But it's not that it's the town's performance we're talking about here in the sense that the town manager is overseeing, not his performance in responding. Okay. Mr. Hayden. Um, I, I, I'm finding myself uh, having to resist drifting towards um, figuring out the MCAS is going to be for the town manager. Um, there, there, are, there are real problems, as we know, with um, high stakes kind of tests, you know, f circle, you know, fill in the box and everything else. Um, that's just that's sort of a general comment. Uh, specifically, or, or, or another general comment about this in, in, in particular, is that um, right now there are two systems in place. We've, we've talked about one of them for, for gauging this, uh, and that is, you know, this, this, you know, government to the max. I mean, all, all of our emails are out there. We get dozens of emails on, on uh, issues that people think are important. Um, everything from the pothole in front of my house to, you know, general policy that the town might, might engage in. That's one major component in sort of gauging the public's um, interaction with uh, the municipal government. The other one um, is a little bit more subtle, but is in place and 
um, is, is I, I, think, I feel fairly effective, and that is um, the series of reports that we already do get about the miles of asphalt that are installed every year. Um, um, you know, how, how many overtime hours there were um, in this department or that department, how much snow was removed, um, how much debris after a storm, um, you know, miles of pipe speed to re uh, response to a, a water main break. This is all stuff that we already do get and certainly plays a role in my consideration for where I put my checkbox and the LIMCAS score on 3A or 3B. Okay, so I think that that was actually pretty clarifying and I would like for us to think about it a little bit more, or at least I would like to think about it a little bit more. So I think Mr. Wald really kind of um, made the point um, that Mr. Hayden's comments then uh, elaborated on that the question is, are we talking about the quality of municipal service delivery, which is kind of the stuff that uh, Mr. Hayden is speaking to, or are we talking about um, the quality of collecting feedback on that delivery? And so that, um, I would like to chew on that a bit more. So, so I think it's the collecting feedback part, but, um, but maybe we're putting too fine a point on this. So um, I would like to think about that one more and come back and with it. Uh, Ms. Brewer? Well, while we're thinking about that, um, I, one thing we could consider is breaking A and B into two separate questions and maybe changing B and then it's just a different question to begin with. But because there, to me, as <clears throat> and, and re-glancing over what was here in the town manager's self-evaluation, is that 3A was accomplished in terms of providing us information, engaged with the community and provided information about town successes and challenges and sought support for initiatives. I think the things he talked about in self-evaluation did all those things. They didn't, the community was not engaged to gather information about strengths and weaknesses of municipal, it, it wasn't, that's just a simple fact. So I don't want a suggestion box, I don't want a survey, but um, I think the thing I'm trying to get at, and maybe this will help us figure out the phrasing of it, is I'm trying to get at things like, and I'm trying really hard to avoid criticizing any individual department, but we'll do so because it's such a simple one. Um, potholes, street signs, um, I want a street sign on my street, my street sign disappeared, I wish we had a yield sign, I wish we had this. There is no transparent system for how that information is gathered and how that information is dispersed and whether or not it takes us four weeks to respond to something, we never respond to something, or it takes us a day and a half and then boom, the new sign's up. I think that's the kind of thing that bugs people, just like you know, little things, parking potholes, the street sign that they asked for two months ago that they never heard back on. And so that's the kind of municipal service delivery that I'm thinking of. It would also incorporate, which we don't seem to have a problem with, but um, if people had problems with when they went to the front, when they went to either the town clerk's office or they went to one of the other desks where people are helped, and if they felt like they consistently didn't get helped, that would be the kind of thing we would want to know. Um, and, and know that it was being addressed in terms of engaging the community to find out what, what could we be doing better to make this work. I think we already do a bunch of those things. We keep offering you know, electronic billing that's even better. And so we're, ahead of, we're way ahead of most of our complaints, but there are some certain areas where it's not clear that things don't kind of go into a black hole rather than into a hopper that's all very well organized. And that last system we had that wasn't a suggestion box but was another type of work order type thing just was way too cumbersome <laughs> and way too difficult to deal with. We need something that's not extra work for people but that they can report back because some things should be finite. You should be able to say, I can respond to this kind of request in X amount of time and look, we got better um, kind of thing is more what I'm looking for. And you know, in the, in the private sector, there's a sense a lot of companies saying, you know, how can we serve you better? Yeah. You know, <laughs> what are we doing wrong? How do we do this better? And and I'm not sure how to incorporate that concept into this. All right, we're gonna we're gonna not get we totally sidetracked on this and and keep thinking about that. Were there any other of the goals that from our evaluation process we realized needed clarification? Of course, we know we have to talk about the human resources goal. So I th I think that one's pending. So we're gonna have a human resources assessment. Okay, so we can just feel like. That's, that's what we meant now, and we're good with that, right. even though so, we had different so answers. Tell us what you think we're going to get from that, just so that we... We agree. I, I, I mean, as a concept, not You're going to get a, literally a human resources function audit. 
great. Uh, Self-audit by my new director with my input. Excellent. Who's gone to every single department right. and collected their information. So we're going to get um, something very awesome. specific about that. So we don't have to change any wording. Yay. All right. Anything else on these for now? Just a moment, Ms. Greeny. So um, are we also good um, with not adding any other new ones for right now? <coughs> Okay, so we're gonna we're not gonna approve them yet. We're gonna come back next time. This has been sort of a crazy <laughs> couple of weeks. I haven't gotten to think too much about this. Um, so we'll think. I'll think, and whoever else wants to think about um, number three a little bit more and what else we want to do with that, and then maybe we'll be ready to approve them at that time. Okay. Now, Miss Greeny, who's been waiting very patiently, if you could come forward. May I approach you to? deliver the um, <laughs> letter that I wrote just before the meeting began. Certainly. So I don't think you have a chance to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Wayling Greeny, and uh, I am the chair of the Housing for All Citizens Group and also a town meeting member from Precinct 10. Um, in reading the packet about your process this evening, I understand uh, from the memo dated August 27th that seems that tonight you are deliberating on what performance goals that you would like to include in 2000, FY 2013. So with that in mind, today I would like to uh, present on behalf of the Housing for All Citizen Groups to you of um, our two additional items that we would like to ask you to consider to be added to the performance goals uh, for FY 2013. So here is the letter. Dear Select Board, as the chair of the Housing for All Citizen Groups, I'm here tonight to ask that you consider including the following in the FY 2013 Town Manager Performance Goals. What you had in the draft, in the draft that you were discussing, uh, left out two very important aspects of issues that impact many of our residents in the town of Amherst. These two points, one, we believe uh, in the performance goals that the town manager should, shall help Amherst become a more affordable community with more housing being created that is safe, decent, and affordable. He will initiate and advocate for new housing efforts and programs. He will work with, the U with UMass to lessen the negative affordability impact of the planned additional 3,000 student enrollment on Amherst housing and rental markets. That's our first performance goal that we'd like to ask you to consider. The second we'd like to ask you to consider is the town manager shall prioritize the housing shortage of residents and ensure that safe, decent, and affordable enhanced single room occupancy units are built to meet the needs of the 16 residents who have been identified by the town as being chronically homeless in Amherst. He will initiate an advocate for CDBG funds be allocated for the ESRO construction purpose. He will commit to building four units per year in the next four years to house the 16 chronically homeless residents. By including, by include these two uh, goals, you demonstrate that you also represent the interests of the nearly 5,000 residents, including almost 400 families who, according to the most recent 2010 U.S. Census survey, are living below the poverty line in our town. Those 16 individuals who have been identified by the town are Mo, Joe, Rob, Max, Chris, Ralph, Mary, Tracy, Raven, Ray, Randall, Dan, Carol, Harold, Nora, Chris, Jay, Christy, Christina, Tassara, 
all these residents that have been around the town, and you see them often on the town streets, on the town common, they show that the ineffect use of public dollars through the additional service requirement on the public safety system or the shelter system or the healthcare system be better to use those dollars spent on those, those systems for building ESRO units for them. This way will alleviate the human suffering, but also we have better public policy, use our public dollars more wisely. So with these two additions, I would like to ask you to consider adding them to the future next year's town manager's performance goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any comment on the performance goals? Any additions or subtractions? Okay. All right. Um, so I, we're not going to finalize these tonight anyway because we're still thinking about these. I think that we should think of these in, uh, as we go forward also. I'd like to commend Ms. Greeny. These are worded very well, and it seems like it came directly out of our it's, it's very much in the style and wording of our goals, so good job. Um, so uh, as far as the, as the specifics of them, let's, uh, let's think about them and, and we'll talk about these next time. I apologize that this process is kind of stretching on a little bit longer, but um, it's important to have it be right rather than have it get rushed. And so particularly we learned about the clarity issues from last year. So. All right, so we're going we're gonna to think about these. We're going to think about the other things we've talked about. Is there anything else that anybody wants to add to our FY13 goals discussion for consideration such that we might be able to approve these at our next meeting, approve whatever we have at that point? Okay. Okay, good. This was a good discussion. Thank you very much. All right, uh, next up, we are nice and late for, I apologize, the town manager's report, Mr. Musanti. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, before I give you a shelter update, I wanted to very quickly uh, uh, remind folks in the community, you may have seen over the weekend on the town website and in the newspaper uh, stories about West Nile virus and uh, Eastern equine encephalitis. Uh, rising concern in the state of Massachusetts. The entire state is on an advisory uh, um, as moderate, uh, higher level, uh, and urging residents to continue to take precautions against mosquito bites. There are uh, some communities, uh, including Amherst, that have been designated as a, at a high risk level. And we and state health officials are urging residents uh, to really take practical precautionary steps to uh, minimize their exposure to uh, West Nile virus, uh, mosquito bites, et cetera. So all the basics, uh, wearing protective clothing, uh, particularly after dark, uh, bug repellent, uh, fixing your screen windows, all those kind of basic common sense things that are uh, spelled out in the advisories that have come out of uh, the State Department of Pel Public Health, as well as the Amherst Health Department. Uh, you can access those on the t home page of the town uh, website. Uh, and I just urge the community to pay attention to that. We'll be getting updates from the state uh, over the next several days. Our next one is scheduled for Wednesday. Health Director Julie Fetterman is front and center on that, working with the rest of us to keep the community uh, up to speed on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, I want to uh, provide an update on uh, winter sheltering uh, in the upcoming season. Uh, we are. Sure. And I'll ask Amherst Media if you could try to adjust the uh, the volume on the speakers within this room again. Uh, I think the level was better before, but it might need to be adjusted now. So they're working on it. See, there you there go. You, you have go. to keep talking so that they can gauge it. So that is that better? Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for pointing that out. Because without the feedback, then we don't know. Okay. Uh, so I want to provide an update. Uh, we're poised to begin a third winter season of 
active town involvement and partnership uh, in order to provide uh, funding for an overnight emergency shelter uh, from November 1st uh, through the end of April uh, at the First Baptist Church on uh, North Pleasant Street. Uh, there's been a wonderful partnership that has developed uh, over the past couple of years between the town, uh, uh, the First Baptist Church and Pastor Mosell, uh, many community volunteers, uh, uh, and uh, beginning last winter and, and uh, poised to uh, have their second year uh, providing the uh, on-site services at the shelter itself, uh, Craig's Doors, uh, who are also partnering with all of those people, uh, plus uh, a uh, uh, growing relationship with a uh, community nonprofit interfaith housing. Uh, so that's all very good, very good. Uh, three winters ago, there was no shelter. Uh, now we have a, uh, a capacity for 16 beds. Um, a couple of other updates. Um, you know that when the shelter was created uh, at the First Baptist Church, because that's a non-conforming use for a, a, a place of public assembly, uh, there were building code issues that needed to be addressed uh, to make uh, portions of the of the church space uh, uh, adequate for shell and safe for uh, providing uh, a shelter overnight shelter. There were sprinklering system and other uh, egress uh, issues that were addressed uh, very aggressively and successfully. Uh, one of the requirements that was needed was to get a variance on building code and life safety issues uh, from the Board of Building uh, Regulations uh, in Boston. And that variance was granted uh, th uh, three, uh, two years ago now, uh, ju but just for a, th a three year period. Um, as we headed into this uh, winter season, uh, uh, staff and I met with uh, the shelter uh, operator, and uh, there was consensus with my blessing for the uh, uh, shelter to pursue an updated variance because that was time limited. Uh, and uh, that required a denial locally uh, by the building department, which was a planned denial, <laughs> kind of a weird process. Uh, that went down to uh, Boston and uh, um, a couple weeks back now, uh, the state board uh, on, a, on a split vote on a two to one basis uh, granted the variance, uh, which was a very positive development uh, because that gives us uh, flexibility uh, over the next three years uh, in terms of uh, the footprint uh, to be considered for the shelter itself uh, and potentially occupancy uh, limits, although they made no ruling about occupancy limits, they were talking uh, about uh, safe use of the space. Uh, so that's a positive thing because it gives us uh, some flexibility in our local local decision making. The uh, uh, operating uh, standards for the shelter will be determined in, through a contractual uh, basis with the town, and it's really through our uh, block grant, community development block grant contract uh, with them that spells out certain uh, conditions. Um, so really beginning in, in after the last uh, winter season and into the summer and now into the early fall, uh, staff and I have met uh, multiple times uh, with uh, our shelter providers and representatives from Interfaith Housing. Uh, staff have identified uh, a number of, of issues uh, uh, that needed attention, uh, including uh, and the, our building commissioner, uh, Mr. Mora, uh, really continuing to express concerns uh, about overall life safety issues uh, in the building uh, that the shelters operated. Uh, 
uh, and things like that. I know that he uh, was scheduled to go on uh, a site visit today, and I'm awaiting a report back from him on that, and that's a very positive step. Uh, his his uh, on-site familiarity uh, in addition to his predecessors, and that was an open issue uh, the last time I met with the shelter group. So I know that that, that was occurring today. Uh, in our health department, uh, uh, again, uh, the concerns have been about, besides just the various placement of, of uh, cots, et cetera, and uh, uh, demarcations between the sections for men and women, for example, there's also uh, concerns expressed about uh, uh, the relative lack of daytime services, how the population's needs are, are served during the day when the shelter is not open. Uh, and the ongoing need that's been reinforced uh, repeatedly uh, by our partners in the region and in state government uh, that it needs that whatever we're doing on shelter issues in Amherst needs to be part of a regional uh, solution uh, needs to be coordinated uh, uh, very closely uh, that remains a an ongoing challenge it's hard for the town it's hard for the provider uh, we're committed uh, to trying to work in partnership to further those relationships. And uh, um, while we've had a lot of progress on the uh, services provided at the shelter the last couple of years, that one, quite frankly, remains uh, uh, not where we need it to be. And uh, uh, that's a very important one. Could uh, you just clarify uh, which point needs? Additional attention? Uh, the better coordination with our regional partners, uh, the, the approach on uh, uh, addressing homelessness, how it relates to housing issues, uh, creating housing, uh, how the uh, emergency shelter providers are working with professional uh, uh, human service uh, support agencies to work with individuals uh, that they serve. Uh, how that can be best coordinated. Uh, on the police side, uh, you know, we made a very conscious decision a few years back to open a shelter. Uh, very needy population. Uh, law enforcement plays a role. We've had a very successful uh, collaboration between the shelter provider and the Amherst police, including nightly visits from one of our officers. And I think that's been proven to be helpful uh, for all concerned. Um, and just uh, uh, concern about uh, calls for service uh, uh, outside of shelter hours. Um, so those are the main ones. Um, having said all that, uh, uh, um, our staff have worked closely with the shelter operators. They've done a, a, a very good job in terms of providing us uh, data on uh, those being served and their, and their uh, 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 backgrounds uh, and needs uh, and those they're not able to serve as best as they can uh, uh, identify. Uh, there are many more people, for example, uh, on, on most evenings uh, who are able to come for uh, to get warm early on before the shelter opens or uh, 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 be fed a meal, but because of the capacity limits are not uh, not able to be uh, housed overnight. Um, so uh, um, so the the uh, the accumulation of all those things, I have to tell you quite frankly, and I've said this to the shelter providers, and it's not something they want to hear. Uh, I have some serious concerns about uh, in year two of our relationship with the current provider, despite some of the progress we've made last year, uh, I'm having some serious reservations about whether it makes sense to uh, substantially expand uh, our capacity uh, when those coordination issues uh, with the other uh, human service professionals uh, uh, need, to be, need to be strengthened. And what are the uh, community impacts uh, that uh, we need to think through. Um, I have not made any final decisions on that. 
my intention is to finalize that, finalize that in the coming days. I'm very much uh, interested in, in the board feedback on this, and uh, uh, but we are looking forward to another very, very uh, successful uh, winter. And I'll stop there. Okay, first we'll take questions and comments from the select board. Ms. Bruin and then Ms. Stein. One of the things that's been, that's been um, very different about this process this time around is that when, when there was a, a big change coming, when there was the change from the warming shelter to becoming an overnight shelter, the select board was rather heavily involved because there were lots of community comments and questions associated with the various rules. Um, if the select board had not become advocating and involved, we would not have the shelter that we have now because at first some of our people that are our wonderful town employees didn't want to do the things that the select board wanted to do and we were able to work together and come to, a, to a, an agreement as to what we could do. Um, it's been a little confusing this time around that there has been press about the fact that the shelter wants to expand and we've heard almost nothing about that at the select board level. So one of the things I'd asked the town manager to mention this evening, but he probably thought was too boring for everyone, was what the process was because although, of course, it is the town manager's job to receive um, recommendations from the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, because that's where the money's coming from, as to the way that the contract should work and they have been in that body has been involved with the shelter since it became a shelter. <coughs> it's, it's also that you know the select board is the place where people expect to be able to give this information and we've been getting lobbied associated with this and hearing things from the newspaper as to how this should work. At the same time, because we haven't really been in the loop from, um, at, so it's like on the one hand, appropriately the shelter hasn't been coming to the select board saying, do something for us because they've been working with the town manager. But now that they're not getting the answer they want, it feels like they're coming to us and we don't know what's going on. So I appreciate um, what you've shared with us and what you've shared with us individually. But for the community to understand that this has not like been this big discussion with, all, with this board too, it's been associated with the way the contract works and that is what's considered normal. One of the things that I am having a really hard time understanding though from the standpoint of the, the way the newspaper coverage has been put out and the way it's been headlined um, in comparison to the paper that we've seen is that it's not been at all clear to me that when we have a shelter that very wonderfully offers meals and a place to get warm to far larger than our capacity to keep people, that we could possibly tease out the numbers between people who fully expected to show up at a shelter and get to sleep there that night versus people who know that it's a place that they can come and get warm and get a meal, which is a great thing, and maybe they'll get a chance to sleep there that night. It feels totally unreasonable to say that because 25 extra people or five extra people came for a meal and we couldn't house them that night, that that means that we are under capacity by five or 25. I feel that that is just not the way to collect data. And so I'm very confused <clears throat> by how one determines what should one do about capacity even given, uh, given all we've talked about regionally and given what the clear limitations are of the space. I mean, we might want to stuff more people in there, but there is a limit as to how many people we can stuff in there no matter what our intentions are. So how do I, I'm very concerned about the idea that we're being told suddenly, ooh, we're way over capacity, and that doesn't feel to me like that's a fact that we can work with. So how do you work with that and work sure. with the West, like the whole Western Mass regional thing? Um, well, first, I mean, the select board uh, to your uh, long-term credit has identified a few e years back emergency sheltering as a priority of the community uh, and uh, on that basis you know as I've taken on this job uh, it's been a priority within the uh, funding for the block grant uh, to fund it. Uh, it's taking nearly half of our social service dollars that are allocated from the federal block grant and being devoted uh, to the uh, emergency overnight shelter. Uh, there's also ongoing discussions about creating uh, a permanent site, uh, which by its nature is a difficult process, but one that is uh, 
uh, absolutely needed because no one has ever considered the current site, however wonderful and cooperative it's been as being a long-term uh, solution. We're also looking at other affordable housing uh, uh, options for the community. And to that end, uh, with town meeting and, and with some CDBG monies, we're pursuing a housing production plan, which will identify and attempt to articulate priorities for uh, creating uh, single room occupancy and other other types of housing. So we have a blueprint uh, to go by. Um, you're right that the uh, shelter contract, because that main policy decision, I think there's there is broad consensus. There's no argument about whether we're having a shelter. The question is uh, how many beds uh, and what's what can be done safely and responsibly in the in the space that we have, and what's an appropriate uh, breakdown with needs out there between men and women uh, being served. I mean, those are the issues that are at play. And uh, what I'm trying to do, which isn't always popular, is uh, have the decisions that we make as a town be based uh, uh, using our best collective judgment uh, with our heads as well as our hearts. Our hearts are in this thing, but we're also trying to make uh, make decisions really uh, uh, trying to take a real sober look at what's what's possible in year two uh, with this group. Thank you. Ms. Stein? Um, I heard about the expansion and then learned that, about the possible expansion and then learned that um, the town seemed to be pulling back from being willing to go in that direction. So as John knows, I showed up at the last meeting between the town staff and Craig's doors and listened for an hour. And I made a suggestion at the end, which I would strongly urge the select board to consider tonight. Um, I'm, as far as I know, the only one on, in, around this table that actually has visited the shelter and seen it in operation. And I've also seen the space that they would use to expand. And I am convinced, um, absolutely convinced, that they can add four people in a new room, uh, which would be uh, a room that's not used for uh, bedding any people at this point. Um, in addition, they're going to do this at no cost to the town no extra dollars are being asked for. They're willing to raise the money. Um, the room would have uh, solid walls and would be for women, as opposed to the way it has been run, even though that's been successful, which, would be, which was separating the men from the women by means of curtains. Uh, they are willing to find the funding to hire an extra staff person to provide extra supervision, even though they would only be adding um, a third more, or in my recommendation, 20% more. So I am totally behind this expansion, and I um, did make a suggestion for a compromise that to me makes sense, and that would be to add four people this year and see how that goes, check the spacing, you know, see if there are more problems. I don't see why there would be, I have to tell you right now, having watched the way this operation runs, which is extraordinarily smooth. Um, and the night that I was there, there were five extra people. That's a one, one, uh, one night out of 184 nights. But the data that I got, from them shows that um, one to four are turned away 80 nights and five to eight are turned away 66 nights and nine to 13 are turned away on eight nights. So I have no doubt that those um, data points vary somewhat depending on the weather because if you know it's gonna be a really cold night, you really would like to be somewhere where it's warm and out of the elements, or even if it's just raining. But the fact of life is the people are out there. It's empty if we just sign proclamations for hunger as we will do later. 
Um, this is an opportunity for people to get two meals, a bed, and to be off the streets. And I think adding four under the circumstances Craig Stores has suggested is entirely appropriate. Thank you. On this side, Mr. Hayden and then Mr. Wall. Yeah, just, um, yeah, and I agree completely. I mean, clearly there's a need for, for um, places for, for these folks. Um, I have a different concern, though, um, that, and, and I'm, 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 I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Mazzanti mentioning it, but I want to bring it out a little bit. Um, part of the, um, our lack of ability to keep up with the demand has to do with um, our policies not being well synchronized with others. And this is causing, um, as I understand it, uh, people to be displaced from their communities to come here. And, and that's, that's a bit troubling because, um, to me, because part of what we heard last year in this discussion is the importance of, of the community that these people are in to, you know, for them to stay there, to be supported by it. If they have to travel here because of, a, of, a, of, a, uh, of an asynchrony in the, uh, in the policies, only to be turned away, they've lost two things. They've lost their community and, and they've lost a, um, um, the opportunity to be in this wonderful facility. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Mr. Wild. Thank you. I mean, at first, I just wanted to commend the town manager for his efforts because we know how hard he works from this and the negotiating with Boston and so forth. So there's no question as to the commitment to, to addressing the problem. And obviously, it's a serious problem. And whenever one hears that people are in need, or especially that women are turned away and unsafe, uh, one wants to agree immediately. So I'm very sympathetic to Ms. Stein's argument in favor of doing this. At the same time, just to underscore what Ms. Brewer said, this is all kind of coming to us out of nowhere. We don't have the context for this. I mean, aside from the general history of the shelter, we can't, I mean, on the one hand, we're talked about, we're told about human need. On the other hand, we're told about safety code issues and, and capacity. We can't judge that off the cuff here at a, at a meeting without adequate preparation. So I feel a little bit caught in that we're, we're forced to, to, to listen to a plea for need and can't perhaps act uh, wisely and responsibly. I guess I would like to know more about what the safety issues actually are. Um, I had the impression that Ms. Ms. Brewer is much more on top of this than I am. I had the impression we were told before that people would not be coming here from other communities, that this was a, a more of a local uh, clientele we were addressing. And situations change, obviously. Uh, obviously, also, the real solution is a permanent larger shelter at some point. But to get, getting from here to there is not going to happen overnight. So I guess part of the question is what happens uh, if we cannot, if there is a demonstrated need that we cannot meet for safety or other reasons, what happens to those people, and how would we start to begin thinking about a larger or more long-term or permanent solution? I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Do you want to respond? Uh, sure, and uh, that's really the crux of the challenge. Uh, and uh, by its nature, it's really, really difficult. There's been some exploration of uh, preliminary explanation by both the town and by uh, the Craig's Doors group for uh, a permanent location or uh, looking at other needs in the housing spectrum, particularly uh, single room occupancy housing. Um, the safety issues, uh, uh, again, it's not lack of desire to want to add, you know, when you see the documented uh, uh, numbers about need, but having it be done uh, safely and in a uh, coordinated way. We have expressions from uh, the Craig's Doors group, I know in good faith, uh, to redouble efforts in terms of strengthening coordination uh, with uh, uh, social service and counseling and those kinds of things. Uh, that's great. Um, um, you know, what I expressed at our most recent meeting was a desire to see that in practice for a season and, and, and see that type of progress because that's, that's uh, out of all the issues that have been raised, that's, that's the most uh, serious one. Um, and we want to be partners in, in helping to make that happen. 
Okay, I'm, uh, I'll call Ms. Brewer and then I'll call in some members of the public. I'm going to ask the town manager to elaborate on that last statement associated with the, the socials and to make sure I'm just clear on what we're talking about. Um, I know that one of the things we've always talked about is the fact that it's all well and good to have a shelter, but then what do you do with people during the day? And you brought that up as being one of the concerns that the health department specifically had as well, and I believe you just stated that now too. So are, 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 what we, are we talking about the whole Western Mass effort and the current shelter operators as a service provider within that environment as being responsible for, would it be, is it fair to characterize it <clears> as saying, making sure we're serving the people that we have now during the day to the best of our ability before we expand capacity? Or maybe you could just be a little more concrete with me because I feel like I'm missing the point. Uh, I think that's it because when the uh, support network uh, for those uh, counseling and, other, and then daytime services are not uh, adequately in place or consistently uh, uh, coordinated, uh, that then creates uh, burdens on the, on the surrounding community. Um, so the, the hesitation is uh, the pace of expansion until that foundation is more solidly in place. Are you saying that we oppose I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. You're going to have to wait until you're called on. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to ask Mr. Weiss, who had sent us some information, if he'd like to offer comment at this time. Please identify yourself for the folks at home who might have forgotten your <laughs> handsome face over these last couple of years. How soon they forget. Mm -hmm. I am Jerry Weiss, and um, I was a former member of the select board when the uh, shelter operation began. And I'm now a board member of uh, Craig's Doors, who is the current shelter operator. We operated the shelter last winter and are poised to operate it again this winter. So I uh, appreciate the chance to speak. Um, first of all, I want to agree with, um, with you, uh, Mr. Musanti, that uh, it's, it has been a wonderful collaboration between the town, Craig's Doors, and the First Baptist Church, and before Craig's Doors, other agencies. Um, I think it's just been a great um, effort, and I especially want to praise the First Baptist Church. Um, I think I sent you a, a letter. Do you all get a copy of the letter from uh, Reverend Moselle, the pastor of that church? who of course is um, advocating for this expansion um, as well as praising the work that we've done. So the church elders are, are totally in favor of this. We actually have a church elder here tonight. Um, also have other board members here tonight and we have Mr. Uh, Noonan, the uh, director, executive director of Craig's Doors and uh, Rebecca Wilder, the shelter operator is also here to answer questions. Um, so I want to try to take some of your points, um, try to go slowly and go over them. Um, regarding the building commissioner, I, I was not at the uh, site visit today. Uh, he did uh, make a site visit, and uh, Jerry Gates, who is uh, um, a member of the First Baptist Church as well as a board member of Craig's Doors, was with Mr. Morrow during the site visit. Um, I think he could speak more about it. My understanding is that Mr. Morrow did not have any specific, uh, had one specific safety concern that could be fixed uh, fairly quickly. It was, it was around what kind of handles are on the doors. Um, so as far as I know, no new safety concerns came up. The state did not, also did not have any concerns with our plans to use a separate room. I just wanna state that uh, currently uh, men and women are staying at the shelter, and they're divided by a divider in a big room. Um, and uh, the town, some town officials have, from the beginning, expressed concern about that. We, our hope was to move to a, a separate room, um, which is near the front, well, near the front door of the shelter, the exit, um, that can house, that could hold eight according to the the rules of how far apart the beds have to be and we would um, have a dedicated staff member in that room um, which was a 
kind of a requirement, of, I remember, of the um, fire chief that there be a, an awake person all night in case of an emergency. So we agreed to that. Um, as far as I know, we've addressed all the safety concerns, so I, I, I would like to hear more about just what is left uh, besides the, the door handle. Um, regarding the lack of day services in Amherst, there, that's true. We do have the survival center, and um, some, I don't know what percent of uh, our guests go to the survival center after breakfast, but I know some do. Um, some go and then leave for the day, some hang around probably. And we all know that some of the homeless people um, do stay in town during the day, uh, but I, uh, I, we don't have hard figures on how many more are there because of the shelter than were there before the shelter. Um, I understand a concern is that if we allow eight more people to stay uh, every night, there'll be more people in Amherst during the daytime. It's possible, um, maybe one. We look at the percents of people. There were 161 separate individuals staying at the shelter last winter. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know how many are, are actually in Amherst. 20, it, interestingly, 24 uh, have registered as resin, residents of Amherst um, of that 161. 37 um, register as residents of Northampton, and by and large, they all go back to Northampton in the daytime. I, so I'm not, I'm not, we obviously are, do not agree um, with um, Ms. Fetterman and John on, on this issue of day services being a vital issue. Because um, at the end of the day, literally, um, these people will either be sleeping in our shelter or will be out on the street. Um, day services seems to be almost a red herring for that issue because that is the end of the day. No matter what the temperature, no matter what the precipitation, we're either going to house those eight extra a night or they're going to be on the street. There's no way around that, that simple fact. Um, I've heard some issues around um, calls for services in the daytime, coordination with our partners. Um, I'm sure there's, there's probably been some calls for services, there's no doubt. Um, and an additional eight, might in, there might be more calls for services, but how many? Um, would it be a brack breaker for the police and fire uh, emergency service? It's hard to imagine that eight more will, would cause that a back breaking amount. Um, I wanted to, uh, later I, I'm hoping uh, Ms. Wilder can speak to um, Ms. Brewer your question about how do we know how many of the guests actually want a bed. We do know that and I let, I'll let her speak to that. Um, if they eat and they stay and they say they want a bed, we assume they want a bed. Um, but she has more numbers on that. Um, I, I think very few actually come just for a meal. It's cold out there, and they don't want to leave after a meal and go out in the winter. It's, not, it's just not that fun. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, this, uh, this issue of coordination, um, people coming from other towns. People come from other towns because there's a shelter. If a shelter was built in Sunderland, people would go to Sunderland. If it was built in Belchertown, they'd go to Belchertown. Uh, there's no guards at, at the border saying, I'm sorry, you can't come into Amherst. They're going to come because there are homeless people out there, hundreds of them. Um, as you know, we, we turned away uh, over 800 during the course of the 181 days. That's an accumulative number, eight one night, six one night, four one night. You add those up and you come up with over 800 people that couldn't be housed. Um, eight a night, you can do the math, potentially over 1,000 beds, bed nights would, it, would uh, result. Um, I'm also, uh, would like, I'm glad to hear, uh, John, that you, you said that you haven't made your decision yet. I, I'm kind of feeling like that. there is a housing and sheltering committee in town who haven't spoken about this. Uh, my understanding is they didn't know anything about it. They are meeting on September 20th. Um, it seems like 
select board and you would might want to hear from them to see what their thoughts are on the matter. I mean, isn't that why we have this? One of the reasons we have this new committee, the Housing and Sheltering Committee. Um, in case you wanted any other statistics, uh, we ended up housing 2,871 people over the course of the winter. And as I said, oh, turned away over 800. Um, there is a fear that if we house those eight extra a night, um, that an equal number will, will come and we'll end up turning away the same number. It's a, it's a valid hypothesis or theory, but th we don't have the data to support that. And I would love for us to find that out and, and have those, have eight people more a night have a warm bed uh, while we figure that out if that's true. Um, I don't think the homeless should be penalized because other towns don't have enough capacity to, to house people. Amherst has now joined the regional effort. For years we didn't, and now we have. Um, I think it's wonderful, but I, it's sort of there's this feeling of we're gonna, that because the other towns aren't stepping up to the plate, um, that we shouldn't do what we can do. We have the, the, the staff, we have the uh, skills, we have the space to house eight people a night more than we are. It's just gonna be really sad if we can't do that. I mean, at the end of the day, that's all I can say is this is, this is gonna be extremely painful to be turning those people away at 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, let's see if I had anything else I needed to say. I just wanted to reiterate that um, we're asking for the expansion so that we can ha have eight dedicated beds for women. Um, 76 women were turned away last winter. Um, that, that dedicated room would completely take care of that problem. I, I would suspect there'd be very few women turned away if we had that capacity. And so to clarify, your expected capacity then would be 16 men and eight women every night? Yes, Okay. that would be the expected. Okay, Ms. Brewer, did you have something directly in response yes. to Mr. Weiss? And, and to clarify, um, I can talk about the uh, curtain at another time. Well, I will just go on to say that had the select board not discussed that at some length with the previous town manager, there would be no women staying at the facility whatsoever. It would only be a male only shelter. So rather than looking at the curtain as a bad thing, it's actually a good thing that could be better <laughs> rather could than be it better. Be, yes. But it's not a bad thing because otherwise women wouldn't be there at all if we hadn't made that compromise. Um, although I can certainly understand, although I still question some of the underlying assumptions, charts like showing that we have nine to thirteen people turned away, five to eight people turned away on any number of nights. It, it's inconceivable to me that we've turned away 76 actual individual women over the course of the shelter season. Why is it so inconceivable? So are we saying, because I think each time we talk about numbers, we talk about different things, and I would just ask that we clarify that as the numbers be promoted going forward. If we are talking about eight beds a night, if we are talking that could well be end up being the same eight women or not, obviously, as the shelter population varies. But when we talk about 800 people not being served or 76 people not being served, I wanna make sure that we're always perfectly clear on if these are different individuals no. or if these are individual beds that are not available on Individual the beds. Those, well, that's those are, not those what are we called say. bed when nights. We, yeah, but when we say people, that's a whole different thing. And that's what I'm uh, well, very concerned with how we confuse that. So I would just like us, as we go forward, to continue to clarify that bed nights makes total sense. We did not turn away 76 women who never got to stay with us. Well, it's if, that we if, wanted 76 more bed nights. Absolutely, I agree with you. These are bed nights, but if Susan is turned away Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yes. Thursday, and Friday, that adds up. That adds yes. up. It's still Susan turned away. Yeah. Agreed. Gotcha. Absolutely. Okay. Gotcha. So I have one. I have a couple other points. Um, Regarding services, uh, I just think it should be known that 37% of our guests were seen by a social worker at some point in, during their stay. 55% were seen by uh, the physician that comes on Wednesday night, Dr. Kate Ewell. Um, that's 50, 88 people were seen by a physician that probably wouldn't be seen by a physician. Um, 18 people uh, either found or were or, or we helped, directly helped to find permanent housing for 18 of the individuals. And 23, we assisted with getting some form of employment. So in that sense, we are kind of 
part of the day service in, in that sense. Um, Thank you. Just want to make sure everybody knew that. Okay, so Thank I want to, just to be clear, nobody is here advocating that we not expand the shelter, is that correct? Okay, so that's what. Well, John, John pretty clearly said he's not very. I'm talking to the audience I'm, as oh, far okay. as comment. Oh, I'm, I'm wondering if anybody here. here is looking to speak to not expanding. Okay. Thank so thank let me much. thank you so let me try and see if we can pull this back into what we think is the select board's role here um so a couple of years ago when we had a big conversation about this we were talking about establishing the shelter and what we thought the community's values were in a broad-based way about what that shelter should be and the select board came down strongly on the side of the community, which was not what town hall officials were looking to do as far as it being mixed gender and it being uh, behavior-based policy. So those were to me very much kind of trying to speak to the community's values about what we wanted this shelter to look like. I'm concerned that by getting into the specifics of how many people are at that shelter, we're way beyond policy and we're into the administration of the shelter. And as numerous people have pointed out, this is not an area that we have expertise, nor is it an area that we should, in my opinion, be concerning ourselves with. So um, I think that I think that we don't want to get into a situation where we're, we're the, the folks are trying to persuade us, the select board members, that, that any particular number is the appropriate number. I would say that I think that as a community, our policy for the shelter, our values as a community are that we want to be housing as many people as is practical and safe and healthy and appropriate. There's, then there are judgment calls to be made within that, in, in, to answer those questions. Um, I think that we need to rely on the town manager and his staff to be making those determinations. At the same time, I think that it's important to be providing really concrete reasons why an expansion wouldn't be possible. So um, I'm, not, I'm not personally hearing really concrete reasons about that. So the, like, the talk about day services or you know these, these different things, I, I can understand how those are concerns, um, but I'm not sure if they fly for, um, for being enough to sort of stifle what is uh, no doubt in my mind the community's desire that we house as many people as we can safely and practically so um, I think that this is about telling the town manager that we want him to be practical and safe and trying to make this decision with his with his experts and we are not experts and so he's got experts in public safety and health and safety and building and et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to rely on that judgment. I think that the best we can do is send a very strong message that says we want it to be as, as safe as possible. Maybe there's some way that if it were expanded, it could be kind of uh, uh, a compressed back if it turned out that specific problems came to pass or something like that. But um, I'm not sure how we can sit here other than, you know, we can vote on some number, but I think that's going to be a very artificial way to, to have a discussion about how, the, how this works. And, and it, is, it sets a terrible precedent for what other things about how the shelter would be administered would happen going forward. So that's, that's my sense of where we should be on this is, is talking about policy, um, giving a, a a message of encouragement to the town manager, but then leaving it to him. Ms. Stein. Okay. Um, first of all, I agree it's a policy issue. I am distressed that we are getting feedback from the newspaper before we are given the opportunity for us to give feedback 
about what we consider appropriate. I would agree that we could make a recommendation that says, um, let's encourage strongly the town manager to work with town staff to expand maximally uh, to the safe level. I originally thought four was a reasonable compromise because I don't like to get in to strife about these issues, but I do want to take care of more people if we can do so safely. I think they can take care of eight safely. So if you want to make the recommendation that it be that we encourage the town manager to work with town staff to allow maximum expansion, um, but the state voted okay, and like I said, I've seen it. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be done maximally. Um, I think the number of extra cases on the street that cause services for our town compared to what we put up with every single weekend from the university and we get no good out of that at all i mean this is a chance to really help some people who need helping we all know that the number of homeless people um, who are educated and have never thought they would end up on the street are now out there and you can't just say you know, that, that we in Amherst shouldn't do the best we can. In terms of what the wider community feels, I agree with you. I got at least five contacts by email or by phone encouraging this expansion. Um, and I don't want to just leave it in John's hands, although I think he's a good and decent person. I care, feel so strongly about this issue. I think we ought to be able to have more input. Now, we might need to put off a final decision, and that might be hard given the time constraints, but we do have other meetings coming up before the opening. I know they have building to do that's, you know, they have to put in another shower and so on. But it seems to me that Craig's Doors has gone every way it can to meet the needs that were expressed. You know, they'll do the door handles, they'll do the shower, they'll put in the walls, and the church is behind it. It's their building. I'm constantly impressed with the fact that they're willing to have their church modified in such ways to help people. I mean, to me, I'm not religious. I'll say this right up front. But if that isn't what religion is about, I don't know what is. Thank you. OK, other select board members about what our, what our role is here and how we have this conversation. Agree, disagree with anything that's been said, Mr. Heaton? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to start speaking maybe before all of the pieces have fallen together in my thinking. But um, I um, maybe it's one of the hardest things for for a guy who's an engineer to say is that you know I just don't know. There are things that I'm not an expert at, and I do rely on people like the building inspector to make sure that. Um, things that he is an expert on are are just so, or the health department uh, to take care of their things. Uh, the same way I rely on um, the guy who drives a snowplow. This is something a job I could never do, or even comment on. Um, so I I appreciate um, the tenor of, of what what I understood you to be saying about um, giving direction. And we have given, I thought, I think you're right, very clear direction to the town managers how to, how to proceed and to administer this. Um, so I'm going to agree. Okay, so just to be clear, so it, you're, you're agreeing that, uh, that we're looking for him to do his best. Do his best with this and make the best judgment with the information that he has. Okay, Mr. Wald. Uh, in a similar vein, I think you put the the issue very well that we do want to maintain the proper boundary, even if it's a fluid one, between policy and administration or micromanagement. I think I'm also hearing, this is where you have to tell me whether I'm right, that you're, when we tell the town manager to do his best, we know we always want him to do his best, but I hear 
a note of encouragement asking him maybe to make an extra effort to see whether it's possible to house more, the best, and make a best effort in that sense also. And then also, if it's not possible, to give very clear reasons why not, because I, I gather there's a certain dissatisfaction with, I mean, among many people in the audience and those who've written and called us over the past few days with the current policy, but also that they haven't, uh, we may never agree, but they haven't heard a compelling reason why this cannot take place. Not that there isn't one, but that we need, if there is one, it has to be articulated clearly. Right, I, I think that summarizes it well. And um, what was I gonna say about that? Um, that, uh, never mind, I'll wait and regather my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Brewer, Ms. Stein, were you? Okay, somebody else from the, Mr. Noonan? Hi, um, my name is Kevin Noonan. I'm the executive director of Craig's Doors. And as Mr. Weiss said, uh, some of our board members, Jerry Gates, who is also uh, one of the elders at First Baptist Church, is also here tonight. And he met with Mr. Mora, who was able to make a site visit and made those recommendations, as well as Jim Lumley, uh, a longtime realtor in town, who's also a member of our board, and Rebecca Wilder, who is the director of our shelter. Uh, I just wanted to cover a few points. Um, Number one, uh, anyone who comes to the door, I mean, there may have been one exception. I think a town meeting member might have come for a meal, but uh, people who come there want to want to get in out of the cold. It's freezing cold out. They want to get in out of the cold, and so they would rather not be turned away. So it's not a matter of us running a soup kitchen. We never, we never set ourselves up to run a soup kitchen, uh, though one may be needed, but w we do not do that. What we're about is harm reduction. There are no public places for people to go at night. There are few public places. Uh, so if you're coming to our shelter, which is the old, sort the latest one to open in the region at 9.30 because of the multi-use space uh, of the church, uh, we can't open until 9.30, uh, which we understand. We're not, we're not griping about that. But transportation is limited. Uh, there are no other uh, shelters that have space. You know, we call around. If we find one and it's in Springfield, there's no way to get them on Peter Pan to go down there. So we're forced to turn people out and then they have to look for an abandoned building or an ATM and hope that the police don't spot them in the ATM. Uh, all this said, um, we've turned away and this has been the single most important problem that we've reported on to the town each month that uh, we're turning away an average of five to six people a night. There's also a growing number of women. And one night we had nine. Uh, all of the shelters in Western Mass are seeing more and more women. So on that basis alone, we're just appealing to your humanity. And I mean, if you can take a decision about the difference between uh, uh, having a curtain and adding uh, women to the shelter, then we're saying now throw them a little more of a life preserver than just the curtain. We need uh, to draw back the curtain, put them in the conference room where they can have a little more dignity, a little more security. And uh, we're not saying they were not secure. Uh, we're just saying that we can give them, we can offer them more and it's safe. When, what's puzzling to us is we, we started this process early in the summer. Everything seemed to be moving along, uh, but then uh, seem, seems, things seem to take a turn, and so we're, we're confused when we hear Mr. Musanti say, and it's been a great relationship with not only Mr. Musanti's staff, but the police and the fire department. It's been, it's been great, really, and, and I said this that in the meeting with Mr. Musanti the other day. It's like, it's a shame that we've hit this, this sort of stumbling block because we're all working so well together. We can take that next step, which is what Craig's Doors was established for, was to build permanent affordable housing. So rather than expanding shelters continuously, that's not our goal. Our goal is to build permanent housing and get people out of shelters. But meanwhile, and we are your local experts in this, we see these people at the door every day, and we're saying we need to uh, we need to uh, do something to respond because our staff is left with saying, "Hey, good luck. Here's a blanket. You know, uh, hope you make it." Uh, also, as far as collaboration, I think there might be some confusion based on some of the things that might have been said in the last meeting. There's great collaboration. We couldn't have housed uh, uh, 18 people, and we didn't do that ourselves. We have we have a doctor who visits us uh, from a program in Springfield. We have a a social worker that comes from a program in Northampton. We have Amherst Community Connections and the Survival Center here, as well as Not Bread Alone. There's a constant uh, cooperation. We go to monthly meetings in the region. So uh, we, w I think what was said was we would like to redouble our efforts so that we can even improve the numbers, so we can house even more and reduce homelessness in our community. And it's, 
something that Mr. Hayden said, you know, it's a, it's a regional program, so that, therefore we take people from Northampton, and it's federal money, so we can't say, well, no, these are our homeless and those are your homeless. But in the end, the medical examiner is not going to find a barcode on their heel and say, Hadley, you know, they're not. They're, it's, if they're on the streets at, at, at 10 o'clock and we say we don't have a bed, they're on the streets of Amherst that night. And then they're more of, of a strain on public safety when they're not in the building. It's easier for public safety to know where people are at night who are, who are transient rather than to be out on the streets. But the part that's, I, I guess, leaves us a little unsettled is that if the decision is to say to Mr. Masanti, you know, figure it out, uh, we're getting mixed signals because when we went to the Bureau of uh, Buildings and Regulations and Standards in Taunton, that was the first time we heard from not only the building inspector who hadn't yet visited the site, as well as one of the fire chiefs, that the town opposed any expansion. So, the, so, the, so they were telling the state that we don't want any expansion. And the state BBRS then voted to approve, approve 24 beds regardless. And they said, what would you do if you were the 17th person. I think it would have been unanimous had it not been for the fact that the fire chief, the fire marshal who's on the BBRS felt that since the building inspector had not yet been to the site, let's give him an opportunity to go there and then come back to us. But the other two felt, no, let's move on. So we, have a, we have a busy chart, we have a busy schedule. So what we're saying is, we're, you know, the, this was an arbitrary, uh, code that was applied. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a book that you could go to and say, what is the code for shelters? Instead, it was, what is the code that most closely resembles a shelter? So it was a rooming house. And rooming houses, there's a stipulation that there needs to be a ratio of eight people to one toilet and, and uh, eight people to one shower. So if you're, and four to a urinal. So if you were to add up the toilets and showers, uh, toilets and urinals, we could have 32 people. And we're not asking for 32. We're only asking for an increase of eight, which we know we can do safely. I know uh, Mr. Musanti has uh, said that we're a new agency, but uh, as most of you know, I ran an organization in Springfield for 20 years that housed people. I also worked overseas in Asia, Africa, and Central America with refugees. So it's, and I also worked with Mr. Musanti's father's office, not him, not his father, uh, on the uh, resolution of the Grove Street occupation in 1989. So it's not like this is new to us. We know we can do it safely. Uh, Rebecca Wilder is very experienced as well. So we know we can do this safely. We're not asking for something that's like pie in the sky or something that we can't accomplish. The church is in favor of it. The, the vendor is willing to do more with less because we're facing a 10% cut next year. And the BBRS voted to, to say that we could do this with 24 regardless of the objections of the town. So it's just this breakdown, which I don't understand, uh, and it's certainly not about coordination with other service providers. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. so I, I think that all of this crystallizes that there are a lot of experts on this area. There are the folks who are running the shelter have their area of expertise. There are the town officials who have their expertise. The select board has no expertise in this matter. All we have is the policy making authority. So I think that um, I think that what was the same as our previous policy discussion on this is that there is a natural sense from town officials, and this is what keeps us safe, and so we should appreciate it, to probably err on the side of caution. And what we said when we talked about the behavior-based issues and the mixed gender was Let's give it a shot. Let's, let's open up our idea of, of caution a bit more as a community. We're looking to do that. We support that. Let's stretch a bit and, and see how this works. So far, that has all worked very well. And so at this point, the town manager, with his experts, with the various experts who are, who are part of the organization, are needing to weigh this new question. I think that it's clear that the select board supports housing as many people as is possible in this shelter that is safe and practical. I think for us to come down on the side of any specific number, it would be as arbitrary for us to say two as it would be to say seven, because we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know anything about how many people per shower you need. I mean, everybody else who's part of this decision making knows this stuff, and we don't. So let's. Let's try and confine ourselves to, 
to sending a, a message to the town manager on behalf of the town, which I think we can summarize as do the very best you can with this. If this can be expanded safely, then safe expansion is what would be desired. If it can't be, then we'll want to know why. Is that kind of where we are, select board? Second. <laughs> So everyone's nodding. Ms. Stein, how do you feel about that? I, I, part of it, me is okay with it. Part of me would like that the town manager not make a decision without us knowing those concrete answers. Um, that I feel that um, the measures that the state uses, like how many toilets per per occupant, how many showers per occupant. Uh, occupant are issues that we wouldn't have any trouble dealing with. Um, I think that's to me really important and if somebody dies on the street this year and we haven't approved the expansion, I'm going to have a hard time. So I would like to be able to have more input. Okay, so Ms. Stein wants more input. She wants to wait for information about these decisions and then support it or not. I'm saying we've, we've sent the message. We're, we're trying to be appropriate in our area of jurisdiction here, and yet I think the message is fairly clear. Like, if this can be expanded safely, everybody wants it to be expanded safely. Ms. Brewer and then Mr. I, I think as, as, a, as another piece to that, and, and I'm not saying something new, I think it's just uh, a reminder of, of what it is, is that if the concrete reason is not comfortable with the amount of day services that are provided, that's not going to be considered an adequate reason by this policymaking board. Now, what we can do about that is what we can do about every decision we disagree with. There are so few where it doesn't really come up. I think it's an important thing to consider. I think it's really important that we all heard about it here, that that is a, a viable, real, actual concern. Those are real concerns that are made by real experts in the field, and they do matter. Um, if it turns out that the o that's the only thing stopping us is the, that level of concern, I think we're going, we're hearing that the community and the majority of this board would not find that acceptable as being the reason. Nonetheless, um, those are concerns that would then have to be, I think, perhaps brought back to us in other fashion, as in, guess what, now we're going to need to put some more money into this, that, or the other service as a town because we are now dealing with this additional problem that we suspected might have been created by doing this. So I think that it is part, I think it's a totally fair thing to have been concerned about. I appreciate that the town manager brought it to us, but it really sounds to me that I just, I just want to make sure we're honest with him at this point as to if that's going to come back as the reason, we're going to say, well, that's not good enough. So that can't be the reason. <laughs> there has to be a different kind of reason to not be the eight. And we have, to, we have to bear the burden of saying, we took your warning and we say we're going to stretch this. You know, just like the people who said, oh, you can't put a curtain in there. There is no way. you got to just do gentlemen in this place. You cannot have women in here. No way, no how. Not going to work. Well, we did it. And it seems to have worked because we have great people working on it. Maybe this will push us past our capacity for stretching, but it doesn't sound like at this point there's a reason on the table that would be found acceptable to this group to not say, even though we don't want to say the number, the reality is we are talking about a finite amount of space, so it is the number. And I would just note that, um, you know, we might be talking in shorthand here about, uh, about you know, what the various concerns are. Maybe the select board would be more satisfied if we had a greater um, detailization, that's not really a word, <laughs> of, uh, of those concerns, you know, so maybe, and so again, this is, this is when, you, when you have to know when to sort of step back and let the people do their jobs who are, who are being paid to do these jobs. So if the, the collective information of the health director and the public safety folks and the inspections folks with their details, which we're just summarizing here in a sentence or two, uh, is, speaks to this representing you know, a, a, a greater risk than the risk of expansion. Um, 
it's entirely possible those details are there. That's just not what we have. But again, is that really our role to be getting into second guessing these folks? I think our role is to say we're but we looking did for before. It to... We'd second guess them before and pushed our way through it. So that's where I keep. That's where I disagree with your final comment yeah. because we did second guess them before. Okay. So I'm not sure this is the right one to second guess them on, no, but right. it's a it's another set form of second guessing. Okay, Mr. Hayden. Um, and um, we're going to hear about it. I mean, we're going to ask for the next report, and we're going to, you know, make sure that, you know, we've heard what we need, need to hear. I think that's that was the whole point of having this section in our agenda every week. Okay. So, do we want to have a motion at this point? Do we want to? How do we want to close this up? And I understand there are more people who want to talk, but I think that this is really about what our role is. I think I think our sentiment is clear. So then the question is, what do we do with that? Ms. Stein. I, I think I'll say it. Um, I think before um, Don makes a final decision, um, if, it, if he makes a final decision to expand to eight extra guests, go with it. <laughs> but um, if he is not going to do that, then I think I would like to hear, have another discussion about this policy and the concrete reasons why not. And I think... Alyssa has said very clearly, and I agree totally, that day services should not be a good enough reason to reject the expansion. Um, to me, the chance to keep eight extra people fed and, ho and housed overnight is a greater good. Okay. Other select board, Mr. Hayden. Uh, I'd like to answer your question directly and say I don't think a motion is necessary. I think our discussion is quite clear, and you know we would we would we take um, we make motions and we second them and we discuss them again, sort of as a formal process of other decisions that we are required to make. This one, I think, we've been we've been clear and effective. So then I'll ask Mr. Musanti. Um, so what do you take away from this discussion? <laughs> what do you do with that? Um, I appreciate the feedback, and uh, I deliberately did not make comments to the press in the weeks leading up to tonight so that we would have this discussion directly. Uh, and so any press you've seen was not started by me. Uh, but I reacted when I was called cold on something for a decision I was contemplating making. Uh, but anyways, I think the feedback is clear from the board. Uh, um, do what you can to house as many individuals as, as safely and practically possible at the shelter this, this winter. Uh, and if I'm not in a 100% agreement with what's been requested by the provider, that I give you some detailed reasons in writing as to the rationale. I will tell you that uh, um, the approach that we are trying to take together uh, is so that Amherst is not an island. We're not an island trying to figure all this out. We're part of a region. We're part of a, a commonwealth. And we've got to give it a lot more than lip service to make it really work uh, in the long term. And that's a real serious issue. Uh, and I want to try to be helpful to help make it happen. I don't claim to have all the answers, nor does the town. but. So I'll stop there. So what, what's, the, what's the time frame? How, how do you see this proceeding? Well, we have a shelter to open, so there's practical issues about right. timing. Uh, I would think within the next 10 days, we'll, we'll bring this to a resolution. OK. So select board, are, are we satisfied with that, or are we looking for any other action to happen now? I'm satisfied. Okay. Lacking the rest of the report. Oh, okay. I want to thank everybody for coming in tonight. And uh, I apologize we can't get to everybody, but we understand where you're coming from, and I hope you understand where we're coming from. And Okay. Thank you. Next up, we have. Oh, does the, the town manager get to have any more report? <laughs> he does. The <laughs> new state alcohol. Now we can beverage. move on to the hard issues. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, I won't talk about the ABCC advisory on caterers licenses. I think it kind of explains itself. It's in your packet. Uh, I would just suggest for 
time management purposes that I hold off on this uh, pool summary until next time. Seasonal Sounds summary. Sounds great. Okay. Um, um, what else? Uh, just a, we have a press release, just FYI in your packet, Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day, September 29th. Uh, residents can get more information about how to participate in that by going to our website, uh, amherstma.gov slash recycling, or calling the DPW. But that's a, a very helpful effort uh, locally. And then lastly, just a memo in your packet dated September 5th uh, from me. There were some, because of our relative infrequency of regular meetings over the summer, there were a handful of parking requests that came in that were, you know, the event was such that it wasn't, you know, convenient uh, for your regularly scheduled meetings. And I gave some approval, and this is just a report on them uh, after the fact as per our policy of having exactly. him do that. Right. Right, and uh, uh, recent upcoming uh, activity, just mentioning I attended a, uh, with a couple hundred other local officials, a uh, regional, municipal regionalization uh, toolkit conference today at Holy Cross, and they've been doing this for three or four years now. Uh, Department of Revenue and Franklin Council of Governments have sponsored this, and I was asked to participate on a panel for public safety partnerships and uh, got to speak about our five town shared ambulance service. And I'll, I have a packet actually that I can post an email that I think you'll find uh, informative. It was a nice opportunity to brag about the men and women in our fire department and the service they provide to the region. Anything else? Um, all right, so the pool thing, not to be difficult, oh. but we're just gonna we're just gonna fill up next time's meeting. So, and we don't have much left for tonight, blessedly. Um, so maybe you want to give us a quick overview of the pool stuff. I think it's maybe okay. we'll just kind of throw this out there, and that sure. way, if people have questions next time, then we're not starting from scratch. But I like the fact that we're we're nice and close to the pool season now, as opposed to at the okay. end of September. Sure. Uh, very quickly, uh, we have a uh, two-page, two-sided handout. Uh, from uh, LSSC Director Chalfont, uh, a summary of uh, participation levels at both the, our newly reopened and refurbished War Memorial Pool at Community Field, uh, as well as our Mill River outdoor pool in North Amherst. Uh, the opportunity for day camps, uh, swim lessons, uh, and this open swim time. Our numbers are up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, on the, on the, we have a recent history going back to 2008. And I have to say, we haven't had a normal summer around here with pools <laughs> since at least 2008. Uh, but the numbers are up uh, this summer. Uh, we had uh, uh, 4,440 at uh, Mill River and another uh, 2,000 uh, plus at War Memorial uh, in an abbreviated uh, summer season. Uh, that's up from a total of 3,200 uh, last year. Uh, uh, but what are the lessons learned? I think uh, I've asked LSSC staff, uh, Barbara Bills and others, to work with uh, members of the community and staff, uh, take the feedback that has come in, uh, suggestions about hours of operation, uh, the different programming, and what's offered at what times uh, at the pools, how it's synced with the day camps, um, um, taking another look at our whole fee structure. Uh, it's supposed to be a family destination. Are there ways we can restructure the fees to uh, make it a more affordable uh, family uh, destination so that, in fact, many more people than the uh, 6,000 or so that came out this summer will come and enjoy it. It's really for the whole community. Um, so, um, so that's what I've asked them to do, and uh, we'll have that dialogue uh, over the fall and through the winter, and hopefully uh, be able to build on these numbers for next year. Thank you. I think it's great to have this data um, from the season, especially having just reopened the pool. It's really great to be able to look at uh, how that all went and, and what that means, and I'm very happy to hear about the 
um, kind of the lessons learned and, and what this looks like for the future. I think that now that we are sort of normal back with our with our pools again to uh, assess how we're doing that and what we sh might do differently for the future, I think is terrific. Um, so if it's not there already, we'll make sure that this gets onto the select board's web packet and, uh, yeah. and folks might, uh, if they read it and they have thoughts in particular about the kinds of things you're talking about, the, the feedback from the community can continue and, and can continue to come in um, so that we're starting next year with, with uh, better policies and, and practices and, and trying to make the pool more available to everyone. Ms. Brewer. Absolutely, and one of the specific things I wanted to mention in terms of feedback, although I w can't imagine they'd be surprised by it, is we have a little issue within uh, the, our pool operations that's just a constant. It's not new this year, but because we had changes this year, we're not really on top of putting up our hours on our website, the yeah. person answering the phone, answering the phone differently than the next person who answers the phone, the sign that's on the actual fence. We need to get a little better about our coordination on hours because it confuses the heck out of people. I totally agree with Alyssa. I could not find, for example, how long the pools would be open in the season. And I looked all over the website um, because I knew people who wanted to swim still. So yes, we need to be better. You're absolutely right. Some, something needs to be simplified to make that easier for them. To, right. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Mr. Hayden. Um, can we get Mike to normalize these numbers to uh, degree days? Oh, maybe not. Anyway. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point, you know, the weather, well, the weather situation, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> attendance per day is more useful than when one season is 50 days and another one is 80 days. <laughs> right. Yeah. right, that's a good raw, point. Raw numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep, okay. Anything else on the pool? All right, anything else for Mr. Musanti? Questions or comments? Good, moving right along. Member reports, liaison representative reports. I think you want to go through a bunch of stuff on the motion pages first, maybe. I, we're not leaving until they're all done, so either way. <laughs> <laughs> How about the Hunger Month, sure. Action Month proclamation? Sure. Is that all right? I move that the select board recognize September as hunger Action Month in the town of Amherst and further to call attention to this observance to our citizens. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. All right. How about the um, Constitution Week proclamation? I move that the select board recognize September 17th through 23. Um, 2012 as Constitution Week and further to urge all citizens to study the Constitution and the ideals the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 and to reflect on the privileges of being an American and the rights and responsibilities which that privilege may involve. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Can I get some of the Chief Justices of the United States to do this too? <laughs> Moving right along for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Right. Um, annual Halloween Street closure request, Lincoln Avenue. Um, I want to just say something about this in terms of the mosquito um, uh, threat. I hope that by the time of Halloween, we will have had the first true hard frost because otherwise I wouldn't want the kitties <laughs> out. Uh, at those hours. But anyway, I move that the select board approve the closing of Lincoln Avenue and Sunset Avenue on Wednesday, October 31st, 2011, from six, no, 2012, and I hope those are, that's the right date altogether. Is it a Wednesday, Halloween? Do you want me to pull out my? Uh, Sounds right. Yes, it is actually, yes, yes. It is right? Okay, all right, so then just change it to 2012 from 6.30 to 8 p.m. with the agreement that at least one resident will be stationed at each barricade wearing a traffic vest with a flashlight and a cell phone and that the police department shall be given the names of individuals that can be contacted during the period of the closure should any issues arise. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden. I just want to appreciate the, the effort that the neighbors put into getting this to us every year and it's 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 a great event you know I really like the idea of you know the community coming together and doing something responsibility uh, responsibly and fun 
Yes, that's been very successful. It's very well coordinated between the neighbors and the town. And uh, yes, they do always get it to us in a very timely manner. Uh, that was for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right. The, the big parking reservation request, major one. I move that the select board approve reservation of seven metered parking spaces on the east side of North Pleasant Street between Halleck Street and McClellan Street from 3 to 7 to 11 p.m. on Thursday, September 13, 2012, and 8 a.m. to noon on Friday, September 14, 2012 for the Amherst Business Improvement District block party to allow bands to load and unload during the event and for setup and removal of the Kendrick Park stage. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden, then Mr. Wall. This is not an annual event, so I can't appreciate for how it's gone in the past, but this is a very exciting thing, and I'm looking forward to, well, two things. One is, is Alex has done a great job of putting everything together, including this little piece. Um, and it's, it sounds like it's gonna be great. It's a great event. Be there. Thursday the 13th, 6 to 10, yeah. Mr. Wald. Not <coughs> to, to rain on the bids parade. Uh, <laughs> oh, I second funny. Mr. Hayden's praise, but I just wondered, in light of the concerns about health, because I see some of the elementary schools are canceling evening events, is, do we know, is there any chance that the bid block party might be postponed or otherwise affected by concerns about mosquito-borne disease? Uh, there are no plans to do so. Uh, we will be getting updates throughout the week uh, from Department of Public Health and We'll be working closely with Julie Fetterman, and we'll update you and the community as we, as we get more this week. But as of now, all systems are go. Great. Just use common sense if you're out, out and about at night. Okay, and in case people don't know that you can park in the UMass parking lot and in the high school parking lots and take yeah. the shuttles from their downtown since it's no driving downtown. Thank you for and mentioning that. And there may that. be other parking that I've left out, but at least... Right. I really know about those two. All right, so for the discussion, Ms. Brewer. Oh, just that we should get Alex to just put out, we do this all the time in Amherst, a mosquito bar. Mm -hmm. Yes, a repellent bar. Put right. out a little table <laughs> like and throw a out a bunch of bottles of repellent. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's all right, the Lord Jeffrey parking reservation request. I move that the select board approve reservation of five meter parking spaces on the west side of Boltwood Avenue moving south from the intersection of Spring Street from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Friday, September 14, 2012 to allow the Lord Jeffrey Inn's wedding focused photo shoot to occur without obstruction at a charge of five dollars per meter. I'm sorry, it's just a funny juxtaposition within the sentence. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden. Um, this is very interesting to me. It's a new kind of business that we haven't had ever had in town. It's uh, I'm glad that this inn is in operation and coming up with these bright ideas. Absolutely. For the discussion. Okay, before uh, I, because I giggled, could you put at a charge of $5 <laughs> per meter after the five meter parking spaces <laughs> instead of, sounds like the charge for the wedding <laughs> shoot. <laughs> Second. Okay. All right. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right. Now we go on to taxi licenses. I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Euclides J. Almeida of Amherst on behalf of Zikwe Taxi. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Kyron Raj of Amherst on behalf of Taxi Express. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Jennifer Lynn Smith of Amherst on behalf of Gotta Go Taxi. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Matthew Thibodeau of Haydenville, Mass, on behalf of Aaron's, Aaron's Transportation. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, we have one appointment. I move that the select board approve Tina Swift to the Konagasaki <laughs> Sister City <laughs> Committee with a term to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. That's that cleans up our motion sheet. 
Okay, so uh, member and liaison reports. And I'll just mention on untimed items, says uh, approve FY12 select board annual report. I think I sent you an email before the last meeting that said, I can't That's imagine that I happen. couldn't get it done for the next meeting. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, probably next time, but this time I'm not gonna promise it, but I do expect it, so I apologize for that. Okay, um, Mr. Hayden. Uh, a couple of things. One, um, I'd like to report, uh, this is especially important for uh, chairs of committees that use this room. Um, there's now a um, sound assistance uh, system here that does not involve the Amherst Media setup. It's in the closet behind me. Um, know that there's six microphones, six wireless microphones, and I haven't used it yet, so I, I kind of want to see it go. But meetings held in here without Amherst Media can have, if the chair goes into the closet and gets the equipment out, um, 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 a sound boost so that everybody can hear. Um, the uh, TMCC um, realized the importance for basically communication and the, the, the affairs that go on here and um, worked with um, staff to figure out what the right equipment was and now to have it installed. Um, they realized that not only is it important for the audience to hear what's going on, but also um, some committees need, you know, some of them get so big and spread out, it's kind of hard in this, this room to really hear what's going on. So there's this new system in there, which uh, by all descriptions is great. Uh, I, I know most of the equipment that's involved and it's good stuff. Um, the uh, Refuse and Recycling Management Committee um, they're really beginning to get some traction on uh, putting together the, the uh, alternatives, trying to figure out what to do uh, post-landfill. Uh, I think I mentioned last time that the landfills are, are being closed. The, uh, the household hazardous waste collection that Mr. Mazzanti mentioned is, is part of that. Um, the, uh, and we, we learned about all the reasons why they can't collect paint as part of this. It's a whole different process for getting that safely uh, disposed of. Um, but what they're organizing for next Wednesday, and we don't know where yet, is a, uh, a summit conference amongst um, people who are knowledgeable in things garbage to try to um, outline really what we need to look at uh, when we talk about zero waste, which is neither zero, well, and is all about waste. Um, but what do we do um, so that we don't have to throw stuff or as much stuff out um, so we'll be tack they'll be tackling that, we'll be tackling that. Um, and last, the, um, the zoning subcommittee, the planning board, um, they're planning a, a, great, um, a great fall town meeting for us. They have, they're bringing forward six, I believe it's six uh, possible amendments, um, uh, zoning amendments for the planning board to consider bringing to town meeting. Uh, regarding converted dwellings, uh, lodging and boarding houses, two dwelling units, single dwelling units, uh, and a family definition. Um, so those are things that they are bringing forward to the planning board to consider. I don't know how many of those will make it through the whole process, but I do know that they've set up uh, times for hearings so that if the planning board uh, wants to do it, they actually have a slot for everything before town meeting starts. Um, they're not using up every last day that we have because town meeting is a little bit later this year than normal. They're, they're on a kind of a normal schedule forward. So, um, uh, looking, I'll be looking for that, and we should be too. Thank you. Questions or comments for Mr. Hayden? Ms. Brewer? I would just ask <clears throat> that they be very careful about the way they phrase their definition of family in terms of a previous uh, a previous title I heard for it at a previous meeting. So if they are going to continue down that road, that they are very, very thoughtful about the way they say family. They, they, as they, in intentional family, for example, as opposed to functional family, which is a ludicrous concept that I simply yeah. would not vote for. I, I think... So, um, <laughs> Intentional family is it seems to be what they were attempting, but um, that those concepts do matter. You know? Yeah, I I, the, I appreciate the care that they've been attending these things as they figure them out. So, thank you. 
Other questions or comments for Mr. Hayden? Um, I would just extend great thanks to TMCC for the new uh, amplification system. That has been a awesome. recurring concern for, for years and years. And um, it, uh, Mr. Musanti and I have had meetings with folks from Amherst Media and Chris Bakunas and everybody. It's been percolating. We've been trying to make this happen, and it's wonderful that it's finally happening. So thank you to the town for manager. For those of us who are hard of hearing, let me say it means everything. <laughs> I just want to echo the thanks TMCC for helping raise that awareness of that issue and Chris Pacunas in particular researching the different models out there. Uh, I was a guinea pig. I turned it on all by myself. <laughs> it does work. It's user friendly. All right. Thank you. All right. Others, liaison and reports. Ms. Stein. Um, okay, I was going to actually say this during public comment. Um, in fact, I promised the person who raised the issue that I would, but given all the other important issues that came up during public comment, I had to do it now. And that is that some committees are not posting minutes. Um, and I, um, and it's posing difficulties for other committees or other groups that need the minutes to carry on their work. The open meeting law says that any committee should have minutes um, or at least notes that are available 10 days after the meeting. They may not be posted, but they're supposed to be available if anybody asks you. Um, could all of us make sure that the committees and boards, et cetera, that we're liaison to at least are up to date and then I'll see if maybe I can work with Deborah to get her to check, um, or I'll check which um, the other ones that don't have a liaison to see if they're up to date. I know that there was one committee that we contacted this year that had the minutes. They just didn't know they were supposed to post them. So it isn't that people aren't doing the minutes. It's just the whole procedure may not be. Okay, I went to a Board of Health meeting. Um, the main thing you all want to know is that the Amherst regulations for body art establishments have been, um, have had been amended, as, and they are, the amendments are effective as of August 30th. Some provisions are that if you're 18, if you're not yet 18, you must be accompanied by a parent or a guardian, and both the parent and the person who wants to get the um, body art needs to have IDs. Um, second, that no one under 18, age 18, can receive piercing of tongue or lip because the physician on the Board of Health felt that she has seen too many awful effects um, post such. And the third is that there'll be no piercing of any body part for someone under the age of 14 allowed at those establishments. The regulations are very detailed, um, but those are some salient features. Uh, there was a member of the Board of, Quelf, uh, <laughs> the Board of Health, John, that had a question for you specifically, and that concerns, um, and I think it's of general interest also, and that concerns the area where the two train derailments were um, this person said that there's special stability in marine type um, railroad beds, if you will, um, and they were worried that maybe because of beaver action, they often see standing water on either side of the area of the rail and wondered if we need to worry about that. So I pass that on to you. I don't, I don't know what we can do. Um, maybe this, there isn't standing water that often. It might be a good time to check soon since we've had a lot of rain. Um, I think they've put some beaver deceivers down there, but I haven't seen them. I've just heard that. So, all right. Um, JCPC met and we had our organizational meeting. Um, we looked at capital budget expenditures through June of 2012. Uh, then we made a wish list, a wish at least, of what percent of the tax levy we would like to see go to capital this year and told Sandy we would really like it to be 7% um, up from 6.5%. Um, but he really won't be able to forecast if that's possible until about mid-October. Mm -hmm. um, Jim was also there. 
Anything to add? Not particularly. It's just, it's just preliminary, and it's going on 10 o'clock. I think that's <laughs> right. Okay. Last one, I think, is that um, CPAC had their meeting. They had a budget update. There's 200000 that they reserved. There's a continuing balance of 76,794 left over. The main thing is that um, Mr. Zomack brought forward two open space items that asks for CPAC funding. Um, and you'll hear more about that as we go on. They both look like marvelous projects. They both would be funded either half or 70% by outside grants. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Keeping the hour. Question or comments from the Stein? Mr. Hayden. Just very quickly, I'm hoping that um, we can get a reminder sent to us about how chairs can go about posting their minutes on, on the web. There is a process, and I, yep. I have it someplace, but I couldn't put my fingers on it. That would be very helpful. There, there is a process that's been distributed to all of them. So it, it, it may not have been, but I know it exists, and basis. maybe we ought to do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, other questions or comments for Ms. Stein? Okay. Ms. Brewer. Associated with that also, uh, I think that's a good reminder in terms of the committees and boards that I have been encouraging the ones that I'm liaison to that when they aren't, since they aren't things like historical commission or planning board or some quasi-judicial thing, that it's not staff responsibility to write their bloody minutes. It's their responsibility to write their minutes and get their minutes up. And some of them are really working toward and have worked with Chris Bakunas, et cetera, to say, okay, you volunteered to do this, you will get it done. And so more people are just going to have to do that. Um, in terms of my other committees, the Black Grant Advisory Committee had um, a hearing on reprogramming some money that unfortunately we weren't able to spend on affordable housing like we'd hoped we would be able to. And so that recommendation is about in the works. And they will be having their hearing soon. They've already put out, you've all received the email as well, I know it went through, that um, showed that they were soliciting proposals and the deadline for proposals is like the 18th and the uh, hearing is approximately the 27th. So please just look on the web rather than depending on Alyssa's <laughs> memory because she didn't bring her calendar in with her. Uh, Disability Access Advisory Committee, I really have not been living up to my responsibilities there. So again, if anybody wants to go to Stavros, that's the place to be. But Mr. Weiss, I always depend on telling us what's happening there. Um, budget coordinating group is about to meet for the first time. We don't have to meet quite as quickly as JCPC. Um, Regional School District Planning Committee, we are about to apply for another grant with an extremely short turnaround time. We believe that since we won't be competing with things like vote washing and all sorts of regionalization efforts, that this is all about school regionalization, that we have a really good chance of getting this grant. But we have a meeting this week. The grant goes in. It has to be mailed in by hand. Whoever heard of these things on Friday? So um, we'll find out fairly quickly if we got that. And so we'll, you'll have a better sense of how much progress we can make in that area. And the Housing and Sheltering Committee, I just want to mention, is as we all know, since we've worked so carefully on this, this is a very new committee with very new people, many of which have never served on a town body before. So when they saw the press, they kind of freaked out because they thought, well, we're the Housing and Sheltering Committee and nobody's telling us anything about this shelter. Well, given the circumstances, it kind of makes sense that we didn't really talk to them about it because it's just not at that place in the road. But it's a reminder that as we develop new committees or depending on who's on committees at any given moment, we're kind of constantly have to work on that communication effort. So I will obviously work that with that on that the next time I see them, but they don't totally get how everything works yet. And obviously we had a little bit of discussion tonight as to how that all works. So they will want to be kept apprised of how things work and then have a better sense of where they fit into the bigger discussions about permanent shelter, like a larger, to, you know, an actual permanent site for shelter, and then of course all the um, SRO, et cetera, type housing. So just a reminder about sensitivity to committees that feel like they might end up not understanding what's going on. On the plus side, they are also meeting with the new consultant for the housing production plan this week, and they're very excited to do that. That'll be their first chance to meet with them, and we wrote that specifically into the RFP so that there was a place for a committee rather than all our wonderful town staff to meet with that consultant. I believe that's being posted jointly as a planning board meeting in case they have a quorum who can attend. 
Yeah, I just wanted to make it clear it's not actually a planning board meeting because they right, exactly because they might get a quorum, but housing and sheltering wants to feel like it's their meeting. Okay, um, and just as far as the um, communication on the shelter, um, so I have to take some responsibility for that. So I've been aware of this all the time. Mr. Musanti and I talk about what the, the various iterations are. Um, and so that that didn't come forward at the previous meeting, I apologize, it is coming forward now. It's partially probably a um, casualty of our reduced summer schedule. So we had fewer meetings and we were trying to pack so much into them and so that should have been prioritized higher on last uh, the last meetings list, but uh, but I apologize for that, so. That I could have been clear on where we were and things too, so. Okay. Just know better next time. Questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? All right, anybody else on liaison reports? I don't think I have anything compelling to report. So I won't. Um, okay. I have Moving to ask on. a question. Yes, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Back on the town manager's report, um, he, he blew right past the ABCC caterer's license thing. I don't know why he didn't think this was interesting. The email I sent at the time, because I'm so obsessed with weird things, is that when these regulations come out, I think, I assume it will turn out like we imagine it to be, which is that we won't have to do all these wonderful UMass things anymore. But if we don't, then we're also losing money. So I would like us to revisit that once those regs come out and we actually understand why they did that. Um, the other piece is this ethics commission piece that showed up in our packet, which is very useful and, and informative. But do we have any tax exempt municipal trust funds that any of us, um, you know, uh, elected or appointed employees might be fundraising for? No. Okay, good. That's that's the answer <laughs> I was looking for. <laughs> I took the inclusion of that in the packet as Miss Brewer is always asking for any this notification we get like this. So, so I was like, she want to know. Me we don't have any. <laughs> I knew um, he would know. <laughs> as far as the catering license, so we have talked about that. So UMass gets around forty licenses a year. That would equal around four thousand dollars. It's a hundred dollars per license. This is being done statewide. We basically all they have to do is tell us. We don't. We don't support or deny or whatever um, and while yes it does represent assuming that they go for this then that does represent a potential four thousand dollars worth of revenue loss it also means a whole bunch of work that the office doesn't have to do that the police station doesn't have to do Hopefully it dramatically it decreases the likelihood of our needing to have a special quickie Excellent. meeting which also creates a bunch of work by staff also as well as ourselves so uh, I say bring it on if they can make that work this time. One very minor thing, but important to the people who are involved. If groups are applying for CPA money, there is a form, and that form got distributed at the last meeting. I don't know if it's been updated, but one should use the form because it makes evaluating the project much easier. Thank you. Okay, Chair's report, um, I gave you a document. I'm gonna try and do that when it's practical. Um, so that's just a bunch of meetings and things that I did on your behalf and I think it's important for you to know. Um, other things, I'll note that at our next meeting, September 24th at seven o'clock during that meeting is when we're going to do that joint election for the uh, library trustee vacancy. Anybody who is interested in applying for this vacancy on the library trustees should send a letter of interest to the select board office either by email or or by uh, regular mail by I believe it's four o'clock on Thursday the 20th of September so the Thursday before the Monday meeting uh, and so that's a letter of interest expressing your interest uh, for more details look on the town website there's a press release there about that and we hope that folks will be interested in filling that vacancy which will last until the next annual town meeting in April so it will be filling out that number of months uh, I think, oh, the other thing, it's late now, but um, if anybody's watching this in uh, less than 12 hours from now, we have our annual ceremony at the fire station, at the central fire station downtown for uh, the 9-11 remembrance. Um, people will gather there about 9.45. The ceremony will be at 9.55, and, uh, and we uh, encourage the community to attend, as Select Board does and many uh, do every year. So that is tomorrow morning on September 11th. Anything else anybody needs to deal with before we're done? So our next meeting then is on Monday, September 24th, and 
Let me just look at the preview. See if we have anything else critical happening then? No, so the, the library trustee thing is the big thing that we know about right now. And we have to make sure we sign a bunch of stuff before we leave. Don't leave unless you've signed 100 things. Did we say the four boards meeting? The four boards meeting is October 11th, which was part of our master calendar already. That was sending word right. out to all of the other um, boards and committees who know about it. So that's October 11th, Thursday night. That's during um, Columbus Day week, when we have, which is traditionally when we have this meeting with school committee, finance committee, library trustees, and um, Mr. Pooler and Mr. Musanti brief us on budget projections for the year, as well as an updated financial trends analysis report, which we've been doing for a couple of years, which is really fascinating. Okay, anything else? Mr. Hayden. I'd like to move to adjourn. He moves to adjourn. So without objection, this meeting will adjourn at 10.03. Thank you very much. I want to know if you can talk faster than that. I dare you. <laughs>